Live from the Melbourne Town Hall, this is John Fane's Farewell Show on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Friday the 11th of October and I was told not to say that. Welcome to the Melbourne Town Hall for the FFS, which is not standing for what you think it is. It's Fane's final show. Uh, we kind of liked the play on words. Yes, it's my last day on the morning's show on ABC Radio Melbourne and Virginia Trioli will join you on, <laughs> on Monday and she will, I'm sure, make a magnificent replacement for someone who's been in the job for way too long. Thank you. It's a packed town hall, and I want to thank every single one of you for coming along, but we'll get to that a little later. I have but half an hour with my first panel of guests this morning. There's a lot to get through, and I hope you enjoy it. Let me just explain, if people are sending in text messages, I've turned the text message screen off here in the town hall because there's so many things going on, I don't want the distraction. But if you do send them in, I'll have a look at them later on this afternoon, and I've just dealt with about a 1,000 emails back at the office as well. Joining me up on stage here at the Melbourne Town Hall are uh, Premiers, present and past. Dan Andrews, Michael O'Brien, the opposition leader who'd like to be a Premier, Steve Brax, John Brumby, Ted Bailey, and John Kane. First of all, could you make them all incredibly welcome here? <laughs> and thank you indeed. I know, I know you'd really like to keep applauding, but every time you applaud, I lose five seconds. And look, every second I've got left is incredibly, left is incredibly precious. Uh, Dan Andrews, first of all, good morning to you. Thanks for coming along. It's very good to be here, John. Uh, you were doing what 23 years ago? Can you remember? Uh, 23 years ago, I think I was working at the Labor Party head office, uh, working hard to get the bloke sitting to your left uh, elected. Oh, OK. So were you, what, you were taking the cash out of the Aldi shopping bags? That sort Something of like that. Yeah, not, not, not quite, John. It, it, didn't I just say it was great to be here? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're tempting us to tell jokes about how we're all here to make sure this is the final show, but no, no, no. No, no, no. no I've had you, a few of those already, there's no I'm doubt sure about it. I'm sure you have. Uh, and what is it in the 23 years in which, well, from back when you were uh, an apparatchik, is that a fair description? <laughs> Fair or otherwise, I'm sure you'll use it. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll pretty much this is the theme for the first half hour because we've got people here who have shaped this city over just the time I've been doing the morning show. Uh, what have you seen that's changed? What's the most significant change that you've seen? Well, the first point to make is that I think you've done a bit of shaping yourself uh, and that's why there's so many people here so pleased. And yeah. Yeah, not that you're leaving, but pleased to be here to say, good, to say goodbye. Yeah, you've all been putty in my hands. Something you? like that. Yeah, not. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, look, I don't necessarily focus on the things that have changed so much. I'm, I'm more focused, John, on the fact that I think Victoria's at its best when we lead, and each of us have had an opportunity in different times to play that role, but I think we're probably more confident in our position as national leaders today than we've perhaps been at any time. And there's lots of examples of that, whether it's leading the nation on family violence or mental health reform or treaty or lots of different examples. And I know so many of those things are very dear to this audience and dear to those that have followed you loyally. That's what I focus on. We're obviously a bigger state, we're a busier state, politics is different, there's a different pace to the way we live our lives, but uh, that national leadership, I think, is something that we've got better and better at, and that's what I would focus on. One of the things that intrigues me, I'm sure Michael O'Brien would love to think he's your main critic, but it seems sometimes your main critics are, for the most progressive Premier in the most progressive state in Australia, your main critics come sometimes from the left. You're not progressive enough for them. I live in a household of critics. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, th and that's a very healthy thing. You know, I don't know how many times you've interviewed me, I don't know how many times we've had discussions off air, but all of us who get the precious, well, the opportunity and the fundamental obligation to make the state better should be pushed, we should be challenged, we should be held to account. And particularly from a progressive point of view, this is the progressive centre of Australian politics. We do things a little differently here. We should be proud of that and we should always strive to do better. So from current Premier to the earliest of the living Premiers, John Kane, Premier back when... Okay. 
back when I was a bushy-haired, mustachioed, bearded lawyer with an elephant earring at Fitzroy Legal Service, John Kane, you were the Premier and you bestowed upon the Legal Service then a Premier's commendation. I always remember how remarkable it seemed that the Premier had time to go and look after some troublemakers in Brunswick Street. Well, we've been earlier pioneers on the legal aid front than you were, John. The legal aid front really started in the early 70s around the Fitzroy Legal Service, service where I went as well as you did. Uh, we acknowledged the changing role of lawyers in society, uh, slow coming. Uh, you were the second wave, I think, you were not. Yep. You yep. Were, no, you were. That, that no should be acknowledged. <laughs> but the, the trail that was blazed in the early 70s was important. Moving on from legal aid, what, have, what are the changes as you've been watching from the sidelines since departing from Spring Street? What do you think are the most significant changes? Oh, the most significant change in politics and public policy is the decline in significance of the political parties. They've just failed to deliver what they delivered to us, to Dick Hamer and Jeff Kennett and others in the uh, 70s and 80s. Policy work. They just they don't do it. And why? Uh, why? Not, not just Aldi bags. It's more important than that. Social media. There's a whole host of reasons. I won't take all your time this morning to outline, but there are many reasons. It's the decline in the, what I'll call the, uh, the thinking society and the decline in people ha having responsibility, not just for themselves. We, I think we did things in the 70s and 80s on the basis that we should do them. See, the lawyers and I was on the Law Institute Council in the late 60s, they picked up the, the need for a, a system that reimbursed those who were the subject of lawyers stealing their money in trust accounts. Yep. And that was a, a serious piece of work. You had to drag the profession kicking and screaming, just as you did drag them kicking, kicking and screaming on the issue of legal aid. So those pioneer issues framed the society that we believe we should have. Is it true that you used to keep a packet of stamps in a drawer in your desk so that if oh. you were sending a personal envelope in the, in the post, you didn't put it through the office It's a mail? good story, but I regarded my personal issues as being s separated from the, from the public issues that I was pursuing. Is it true? The stamps are still in the drawer, John. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few. It is true. Isn't it? It's a mark of your integrity and the, oh, the leadership that you showed as Premier. You said, yeah. hang on, I'm, I'm not here. Okay. Yeah. I'm not well, here a for a free ride. Your public duty should be separate from your pers personal interest. And that was absent in many, many ways when uh, we came to government in the 80s. John Kane, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from the earliest uh, of the Premiers and we've heard... No, there's more important things than that. Policy work is the public duty of all of us. Yes. And it's the, it's, the Westminster system works best, and it only works well, and we're seeing it around the world at the moment, it's not working well, when the political parties accept the responsibility to shape and frame it. They're not now. John Kane, thank you. Michael O'Brien, have you got a box of stamps in your desk drawer? <laughs> I do, actually. Yes? Uh, yeah, oh, look, I, 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 I agree with John. I think it's a good point. Um, you need to remember that you're there to serve the public. They're not there to serve you. And I think there are little ways you can do that. There are big ways you can do that. So I actually thought that was a very good example. And so as up here, we obviously you're not a Premier. You'd like to be a Premier in one day. Who knows? You may become a Premier. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be up to these people Stra here, John. Str stranger things have happened, John. Yeah, well, hey, 20 years ago, we'll get to Steve Brax in just a moment. He's up here with me as well. Uh, what do you see as the significant issues going into the future? I've been asking about the past, but what do you see as the, the next phase of reform? Uh, I think population growth and managing population growth is a huge challenge for Melbourne and Victoria. I think at the moment we've got very strong growth, but it's quite unbalanced and that's having an effect on people's quality of life. And I think that we, don't, we shouldn't be scared of population growth, but we need to far better plan, plan for it, manage it, and make sure that people's quality of life isn't diminished as a consequence. And that's not just about investing in infrastructure, that's also about planning laws and making sure that we share that population growth right across Victoria, not just concentrating it in Melbourne. OK, and well, undoubtedly we're going to hear that a lot more and I'm sure Virginia will put you through your paces when she gets mm. the chance as well. Uh, John Brumby and Steve Brax are also here and in a way uh, 
20 years ago, I noticed that one of the newspapers has been looking back on what happened when Jeff Kennett, who sends his apologies and is unable to... He's having a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> unable to join us today. Uh, look, I, I can't let that pass without explaining. We tried to invite all the premiers. Dennis Napthine also, he does a community radio show on air on a Friday morning in Warrnambool. And he said, oh, I can't join you. I'm on air at the time, which I thought... Well, with great respect, I thought that was a very good excuse. Uh, and Jeff Kennett told us he just wasn't able to be here. So it was with some regret I said to him, I made a personal request and said we're trying to get all the premiers here for this sort of a conversation. He wasn't able to be here. But Steve Brax and John Brumby, because in a way, in fact, I think Steve Brax in the paper today, you pay tribute, as does Jeff, to the groundwork done by John Brumby, which led to that extraordinary turnaround election 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, well, 23 years ago when you were... Starting out, um, John and I were campaigning around regional Victoria and really the resurgence of the Labor Party. And um, Michael O'Brien mentioned about growth in the regions. Well, we were on that um, really in the 90s. We were talking about provincial growth, um, about opposition to the trickle-down policies of the Kennett government where you expected that somehow you could grow the centre and everything else would happen. We, we felt that we needed to invest in the regions to make sure that we got growth and development happening, and that was the hallmark of really what happened um, 20 years ago when we unexpectedly, unexpectedly got to government in 99, and we did it on the back of, uh, John, I think it was about seven or eight regional seats, which was extraordinary, really. And you hadn't seen that sort of resurgence for Labor um, in regions. Um, and the only other time you saw that was John Cain's father's government, really, when you saw those regions who were coming to Labor. Now, John Cain, of course, um, had one seat in Ballarat, one seat in Bendigo, um, and had some seats in Geelong, but we had a significant clean sweep. So it was a, uh, an important era, that, that era, when John and I were crisscrossing the state, talking about country and regional Victoria, saying it should be part of the whole growth um, sort of notion of, a, of Victoria, and that was really what told, I think, in 99. Was it just that issue? No, it wasn't that issue. It what was about a, the perception that you managed to create? It never is one issue. You no. don't lose an election on just one issue. It's usually two or three. And probably it was, and this audience would remember, the significant period when there was cuts to education, to health, schools were closing, hospitals were closing... Uh, we saw teachers who were being sacked. We saw gags on the workforce who weren't able to speak up. Those things were accumulating uh, alongside the disparity, uh, the dis disparity in growth between the city and, and regions, um, al alongside, I guess, a, a time when the, the Premier of the day was seen as arrogant, out of touch and didn't care. And so we played on that. And um, it was those multiplicity of issues which really got us to government. Was it just something you played on? Was it a perception you helped to exaggerate? Or was it real? No, it was real. Um, <laughs> of course it was real. God help us. Um, Jeffrey will be here in a minute, John. Yes. He's, you, you, he's, you he's to, his way through the crowd outside. Well, well you know, you talk to... <laughs> right of reply, yeah. Uh, you know, we talked to communities in which uh, their rail line was closed. We had to reopen the Ararat line, the Meribah line, the, Dulles, the um, Bairnsdale line. We had to upgrade rails to the regions. They were all closed or degraded. Uh, hospitals that were closed, we had to reopen. Schools that were closed, we had to reopen. Yeah, this was a significant, significant issue. John, I think the... 16 minutes, 16 minutes think... to nine on ABC Radio Melbourne, broadcasting for my last show from the Melbourne Town Hall. We have here on the stage with me Dan Andrews, the Premier, and then all the previous Premiers that we could get to be here on stage, with only the exception of Jeff Kennett and Dennis Napthine, who were unable to be here, which means you can say whatever you like about them, because they're not John, here to respond. John Kane. I think the change was more profound. There were several... There were detailed things that Steve has outlined, but till 1982, when we won government, Labor had held office, held government in Victoria for eight years. For the next 40 years, in 2022, when Dan Andrews comes to his next election, over those 40 years, Labor will have been in government for about 28 of them. Mm. <laughs> that's, not, that's not by accident. 
profound things were done. The constitution had to be changed to give you a fair voting system. The electorates were loaded against Labor in the 70s. There was a whole host of things that were, were, changed the shape of this society then. And that's, that's what it has resulted in. Victoria is a Labor state and it wasn't before. I'll get to Ted Bailey on that in just a moment. John Brumby, you then got the hand pass mm -hmm. from Steve Brax in time to try to establish yourself before you went to the polls. And we'll hear from Ted in a moment about that election. What do you think of the significant changes? Because you were in federal parliament before you came back and went into state parliament. You've been in public life now for decades. Yeah, and I think there have been, uh, been huge changes, John. And I was, I was thinking about this as I was um, uh, walking in this morning. But I think, you know, the big one, um, to, to reinforce what Michael said before, it's, it's population change. So, you know, when Steve, Steve and I, when we were elected back in 99, uh, population growth in Victoria was under 1%. And I remember this, we used to, because of the budget projections, what's the population growth going to be? And it's steadily built up. And really, ever since that time, Victoria has been growing at pretty close to 2% per annum because people want to live here, for all the reasons Steve said, because our hospitals are great, our schools are great, um, and our quality of life is so good. The second aspect of population is, is students. So that's been a profound change, the number of international students. So you see that around Melbourne and Parkville and the top of Swanston Street. I think the second big change, John, has been technology. You know, the, the 2010 election campaign, my staff in the back said, we're going to introduce this. It's a, it's a bit risky. It's a new initiative. We're going to have iPads. We're going to have an iPad in the back of the car with us, right, when we campaign. But you think of Uber, you think of the technological revolution, you think of how it's changed parliament and the work of, of politicians. I think that's a big change. I think politically the change has been to um, freer votes in the parliament. So Steve and I did that a little on what was called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Sorry? Uh, stem cell research. Stem cell. Right. Um, my government did it. Uh, Dan was the health minister. You wouldn't want with, to fight an election on with that, would you? abortion law. Well, it was about medical research, actually. Yeah. Um, so maybe you would. But we did it on um, uh, abortion law reform. Yep. And, of course, Dan's government has done it on uh, voluntary assisted dying. So I think they're three of the, the big... The big reforms? Well, I think they're the big... You asked about the big, the big changes. Yep. And I think the other thing is, the, um, getting back to the regions, the, the, the movement of people now between the regional centres in Melbourne is something that couldn't have been imagined back in John Kane's day. So Steve and I, we did the fast rail to the, to the regions. The number of people in Ballarat, for example, who commute back and forth to Melbourne every day in a workforce, it's around a quarter of the workforce is, yep. is moving every day. Absolutely. And this mobility across the state. And, and the final thing I want to mention is, is the whole sort of response to climate change. We built the water grid across the state. No other state's done that. And I think we copped a bit of flack for it, for things like the desal and pipes but it has served our state extraordinarily well. It certainly has, and we have to acknowledge also the work of Joan Kerner and, you know, the fact that there are six men up here. Victoria's had a woman Premier. Sadly, she's no longer with us and she's much missed, I know, in the Labor movement, but as a pioneer in Victorian state politics, uh, Joan Kerner, who copped a lot of the flack that you're referring to there as well, uh, much missed, I'm sure, by many of you here, and we should acknowledge her as well this morning. Ted Bailey, Ted Bailey, you came in and managed to knock off John Brumby after he got the, the, the handball from Steve Brax. We did a deal. What was that? No, I, I, John, John had had enough and we did a deal, didn't we, John? <laughs> <laughs> Just the public weren't let in on the secret. So how do you see it and those changes and you... Well, one thing I don't want to do here is re-prosecute all the arguments that... Um, political parties uh, do have and have had over the past years. Most governments do good things. Uh, most governments make mistakes. But I think there's a core to the state of Victoria that needs to be rec recognised, and that this, that this state uh, is an intellectual state. It's a multicultural state. It is progressive in many ways. It has its conservative streams. But it's also the arts states, it's the cultural state, it's the business state, and it has an extraordinary history of excellence. And uh, 
Perhaps some people didn't expect we were going to win, but we, we were confident that we were on the right track and uh, in hindsight you'd say uh, we won the unwinnable. Um, we won in uh, 2010, I believe, because we pitched to that market and I believe that's the future as well. And if you look at the challenges that lie ahead of us, I don't think most Australians have got any idea uh, of how we're going to cope at the moment. In the next 30 years, the world's population grows by 40%. 40%, and more than 2 billion of that 40% will be in the Indian Ocean region, and a lot of it on our uh, northwest uh, frontier. And we have to be part of that. We have the opportunity to be part of it because we have a multicultural base which gives us the gateway, and we need to reach out internationally at every opportunity. And I pay credit to, to the work that John did in China, uh, we did work in China, we've done work elsewhere, we, we uh, elevated international engagement. Dan's done it in a different way, but increasingly that is our future. It sounds as if you're in fact criticising the current Prime Minister, who was no, just the other day. No, well seriously, in Liberal Party terms, you're a revered figure, you're someone who you know, took the Liberal Party into office, there's not that many people... I'm not here to criticise anybody, but, John, and that's what... Well, he was talking about, you know, kind of... He's worried about internationalism. He's going with Donald Trump and saying, you know, we're not going to go down that path. Well, well regardless of what people say, the, the reality is we have to engage because it's on our border. And those who would stand up and say, put a halt to population growth, I don't think that's the answer. The answer is to find a way of more constructively, putting, constructively and efficiently putting our infrastructure in place that can cope with the growth because we're in... Uh, catch-up mode to some extent, keep-up mode to another extent, we've actually got to get, get ahead of that growth. And uh, if you look at the projections for the City of Melbourne, I think you can probably increase those projections very significantly. And it's important that we actually focus on development in infrastructure into our regional cities. And John and Steve pitched out into the fast rail. Well, whatever the fast rail was in introduced, it's going to have to be much faster in the future. Each of you have done amazing things, and I want to acknowledge that, and you've all made your mark on the state. Um, very quickly, though, what always amazes me, and I want to get through, you know, there's six premiers, and I know you're all very shy and retiring, but, uh, sorry, five premiers and an opposition well, leader. Outlasted us all, John. And so I appreciate the vote of confidence, John. That's yeah, well, fantastic. I'm just trying to be strictly accurate. It is the ABC, <laughs> after all. They might do that sort of stuff on commercial radio, but not here at the ABC, Mark. <laughs> but what always amazes me is how tribal politics has become. And I've worked with all of you, and I've worked at different levels, fairly closely got to know you all, and I'm always amazed at how tribal politics is and has become. Very often, I'm talking to people on different sides of the divide, but you don't have that much to do with each other, and yet you all pretty much agree on the big things. Why is that? Dan Andrews. Oh, I think the system is at its best when you can work together, and we've seen some examples. John mentioned a few in social policy terms. It, many different views on voluntary assisted dying, but I think it was in recent times it was the parliament working at its best. A big issue that's confronting and challenging, deeply personal, but we're able to put aside those tribal, tribal differences, the things we argue about every day, to get a, what I think is a fantastic outcome. At the same time, John, I don't, know, I'm, I'm, I don't shy away from the fact that there are things that are worth fighting for. You can do it in a civil way. You can all sit and share a stage like we are today, but there are lots of things that are worth fighting for. And I'm not in any way upset to disagree with people who, who don't see the world my way, but you can do it in a civil way, and that's always important. I, uh, just, Steve Franks. Yeah, I um, actually would um, contradict your view because I don't think it is any more tribal than it has been. You look at the 50s and 60s, it was pretty tribal then, by the way. You look at the split in the Labor Party, which happened um, uh, post the Second World War, and it was pretty tribal then. Uh, we sometimes get caught up in the present and don't re really reflect on what happened before our antecedents. And I think that tribalism has been there for a long time, and it's uh, not that much different today. In fact, it's probably less pronounced in some ways. There's more commonality in some ways than there has been in the past. There was more ideological differences, I think, previously than there is now. Um, and uh, so I would sort of contest that view. John Brumby? 
Yeah, I think. I mean, there's always been an element to tribalism, but I agree with Steve. I mean, it was it was you know tougher back in the in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Major splits between the parties and within the parties. But I think to go to Dan's point uh, and the point I made earlier, I think with the Parliament, some of the best debates and the best reforms we've seen has been when we've had free votes. And, um, you know, you can't have free votes on everything because you get like the American system where you've got three lobbyists to every congressperson. Um, But I think what we've seen on those free votes has been the parliament, as I've said, working at its best. And I think one of the challenges is to identify opportunities where you can have more free votes in the future, where people can speak freely, their speeches can make a difference, and people of like mind can come together to make significant social and economic reform. And I think that's the big challenge for the Parliament. Thank you, John Brumby. John Kane. If the parties are, if the parties are working properly, doing the policy, it's policy work, the, the policies are framed out in the, within the parties. That's when they get good government. That's what not, we've not got now. And all the ragtag, bobtail offshoots last for about 10 minutes and seek electoral support. They don't get it in the long term. Very quickly, John, I'd uh, very much like to see more scrutiny return to state politics. Once upon a time, we had three half-hour television programs every evening of the week devoted to state politics. They've all gone. Uh, It finished with State Line, which was moved to a Friday night. Very few people watched it. It had no impact on the headlines in the next day. It's all gone. And I'd say there's a challenge there for the ABC. Bring back State Line, put it on a Monday night, and let's get some scrutiny back into state politics. <laughs> bring back, I know. John, John Brumby. Well, I know somebody who could run that show. Yeah, who? I, I know, I'm looking at him. No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. If- I'm leaving in case you haven't noticed. Michael O'Brien, briefly. I think politics is is at its best when it is a contest of ideas. And that's sometimes that's something that's missing. We need to have big ideas back. We need to be prepared to debate them. And, you know, I think tribalism isn't a good thing, but contests of ideas and values actually are. Okay. Now, to which of you do I owe the biggest apology? Because I know at various times I've had you across the table and I've got that look from you. (laughs) Well... I've got to say, I asked somebody who does a bit of research for me. I said, try and find an interview with Fane where, you know, he cracked a few jokes and he was funny. He said, can't find it. It's, it's, just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just Fane arguing with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to you don't owe me apology. John, you've been, you've been a wonderful, wonderful asset for Melbourne, really. You have, and it's part of that pluralistic society. It's about the debate of ideas. It's about leadership for Victoria. Um, you're a respectful person. You're a courteous person. And you've been just an extraordinary asset to our state. Well, and really I just kind. want to put that on the record. Thank you. And Dan Andrews. Settle down, settle down. You can't be, you can't be the centre of critical thought in our nation unless you've got critical thinkers. And, John, you have held us all to account, taken us to task, entertained us, enthralled us. You'll be missed. And I just want to say thank you. But don't you also want to say that sometimes, you know, I've No, you're always the line. fair. Always fair. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Pratt. And, and John, could I, could I add that um, in an era when we're really questioning the media significantly and the whole issue of fake news is just, just a, a dreadful development, to have someone like you who actually undertakes research, who understands the topic, who is prepared and ready and able when an interview is undertaken is such a refreshing thing, and I hope we never lose that. I hope we don't lose the, the sort of ability that you've shown to make sure it's, um, it's about proper and appropriate research going into an interview and making sure you get the best out of that interview. Thank you, Stephen. Ted Bailey, you've, um, you've not always appreciated that research. There have been times where you've scowled at me from your significant height? I don't remember a single time scaling that vision. In fact, I don't remember walking away from interview, an interview with you uh, thinking that I'd lost. Oh, very good. Uh, Michael, Michael just, O'Brien... Just very, I, I, just very quick. Yeah. Um, I think there was someone who 
pretty well walked away from an interview with you in 99, and he's not here, by the way. <laughs> Michael? Yeah. John, the, the greatest compliment I can pay is that there was no such thing as a free kick in a John Fane interview. <laughs> you had to do your homework, you had to be on your mark. Even if it was a story for me where the government's having a bad day and I'm called on, uh, I still know I'll get tough questions because you're the greatest devil's advocate Melbourne soon. We're coming up to the 9 o'clock news. Could you please thank John Kane, Ted Bailey, Dan Andrews, Steve Frax, John Brumby, Michael O'Brien. <laughs> On ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria at the Town Hall. Plenty coming up after the 9 o'clock ABC News. John Fain's farewell show. And you want to run your whole show and waste all of your listeners' time on issues that Stephen Mayne has raised. Well, keep going. I'll just sit here and drink my tea. And that's the only response. Well, you're pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. 17 minutes to nine on 3 alone. Minutes past nine. That was a little ambush. So, my um, my wonderful producers and the tech team, who I will be thanking formally later on, are apparently going to ambush me and drop in all these little gems, these little pearls, from time to time during the course of the morning. So, I hope you enjoy them as much as I won't. <laughs> Here we are at the Melbourne Town Hall. It's John Fain with you on my last show. And uh, look, there are still some T-shirts I think for sale. Man's just come out holding some. Hold it up as a trophy. There you are. Well done, sir. Uh, the T-shirts are a limited edition. They'll never be made again, and the, uh, the template will be destroyed after today so that there can never be a rip-off revival of them or a Mark II version. So get them while they're hot. Hurry, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Six minutes past nine. We've got a bit of entertainment coming your way. We've got all sorts of people who are going to pop up along the stage between now and 12 noon. In fact, it's going to get a little bit hectic. So we'll see how we go. And I'm kind of looking forward to some of it, and I'm kind of dreading other bits of it. One of the things I was very much looking forward to was being able to publicly thank and welcome to the stage someone without whom I can quite literally say I would not have been on air for 23 years. Joining me on the stage is Sue Howard. And Sue Howard... For any of you unfamiliar with Sue Howard, for her radio career, she was an exemplary broadcaster and role model, and then decided, for reasons none of us understood, that she would totally turn her back on being behind the microphone and become a manager. And she became a manager in regional radio. She saved me from self-destruction on a number of occasions. And then she went into managing what was then called 3LO, and then she ended up, to cut the long story short, she ended up being in charge of everything and several times talked me out of leaving the ABC at various points in my broadcasting career. I was hoping that Terry Lane would join us on stage here with Sue Howard today, but Terry was unable to and instead had a brief chat to us yesterday on the phone and we sent him our best wishes, but Sue Howard, good morning to you. Good morning to you, John Fain, and thank God you're going because... <laughs> Honestly, I don't know if I could have another one of those lunches where we talk about whether you should stay, whether you should go. Whether... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said you enjoyed it. <laughs> when you paid. <laughs> yeah, don't remind me. Yeah. So uh, you look back on it now. How long since you left the ABC? Uh, nine years, ten years, something like that. Nine, yeah. y- nine, nine years. Do you miss it? Uh, I miss this bit. The the bit that matters, and I miss none of the politics, the, um, the haggling for money, the haggling to survive, the arguing about whether one of the presenters has been biased or hasn't been biased. I miss none of that. But I do miss this, and I really... Um, I tried very hard not to have favourites, but I have to say, I can honestly say now that this has always been my favourite radio station ever since I was 10 years old. Even though you were in charge of, what, 60 of them? Yeah, yeah. But you still have a soft spot for your first child, I think. And um, the thing that I love about this station and that you... I, I always hoped that you would bring to the station, and thank God I was right, is a passion... The, the, 
that the people who listen to us and the people who broadcast have a passion for this city and this state, and it really matters. So you were in charge of 60 radio stations, yep. including all the capital city regional stations, yep. national networks, all the rest of it, Radio National, Triple J, Radio Australia, all of that was part of your yep. extraordinary it was empire. All I don't know. my fault, yes. Yeah. And I don't know how you did it, but what's different about this one? What is it? I think in, it's, it's a little bit listening to people talking in the first half hour about, about oh, being the, the, the politicians. Most, yeah. yeah about being the most progressive state in the country. There is a little bit about that. So that you can have, I hate this cliche, but I'm going to use it anyway, you can have a contest of ideas through this radio station that you don't hear in many other places. You do hear it on Radio National, but in a different way. So you don't hear it quite so passionately anywhere else. And 20, what was it, 23 and a bit years ago when you and I had a conversation? Well, we first worked together. When I was on Radio National, I did the yep. law report. So I came to the ABC in 1989 and I did it as a, um, how can I say this without sounding crass? Go on. I can't actually, I have to Just sound crass. I, I thought that I would have a more successful career back in the law if I came and did a bit of, you know, appalling self-promotion through the ABC and I thought I can get some leverage out of that, that'll be good, I'll, um, I'll get a bit of a name and then when I go back and work as a lawyer people will say, oh yeah, I, I know him, he was on the radio and I might get better work and I might get it quicker because otherwise it can be a bit tricky and yeah, I've never got back to it. Hmm. But you were around then and you were one of the revered people, you were one of those whose wisdom we kind of called upon, uh, not just for musical advice, which you were very, very good at, but just, you know don't give the boss the shit sort of advice. No. Um, Until yeah. you were the boss and then we had Until, to give you the yeah, shit. Yeah, well, precisely. But um, you went away for a little while. Uh, I think you had a little fling in television and then they dumped you. No, I got sacked. Yeah. <laughs> I dumped you. I got, and... no, I got sacked on the radio. So someone who is nameless and whose name rhymes with Barry Chapman who was the manager of Capital City Radio Stations and local radio, Barry Chapman, uh, he sacked me. And that was, what, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. And he rang me. It was actually on my birthday. He didn't know that. I did. And he said, uh, you're not going to be part of the lineup next year, and we just thought we should let you know. And I said, well, why? I've never even met you, and you've sacked me. And he said, uh, we don't think, whatever your future is, we don't think it's on the radio. <laughs> <coughs> Ah, yes, well. So, so anyway... Well, very, I... very good man. Now, just a sequel. Barry Chapman left the ABC not long after and ended up in a job, I think, at the, media, the Australian Media and Television... What's it called? Radio and Television School? Or yeah, something afters, like that? Yeah. Afters, yeah. The Film, Television and Radio School. And one day they put out a press release. And I was back at the ABC by then. They put out a press release saying, yeah, we've got this great new program that we're going to launch. And if you want to, you can do an interview with our boss, Barry Chapman, about this fabulous new program. And so I said to my producers, oh, great. Let's get Barry Chapman back on. And he was, I nearly said another rude word. He was rather anxious and inquired whether or not I was in any way intending to raise on air the fact that he may well have sacked me some however many years before, and of course I was far too gracious, and only did it through a very backhanded comment at the end. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after you'd gone, um, we, were, we were looking to put together a radio station that would much more reflect this city, and I had a conversation with my boss, who was the best boss I've ever had, a man named Murray Green, fantastic boss, and said, what do you think about John Fane? And he said, ooh, really? <laughs> really? And I said, look, there's a chance that he might be more humble <laughs> now that he's been sacked. The only trouble is he thinks he's funny. Anyway, we had a conversation, and it turned out to be quite a good decision after all. <laughs> uh, you originally offered me a, uh, a one-year contract, yep. which we met at a cafe in the inner city, and you offered me one year, and I said, nope, um, because I know that in one year, that's when people are sharpening their knives and saying, oh, this is crap, it's not working. So I said, two years or nothing. 
and you very boldly gave me two years and then another two years and then some more and then some more and then when I tried to quit because the state government some years ago, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, the state government offered me a job and I was asked to be the legal services commissioner which is the kind of ombudsman, the complaints person for the legal profession and uh, the Attorney General's staff got in touch and said, oh, the attorney would like to meet you. And I said, oh, hang on, what's this about? And they said, oh, he wants to talk to you about, about the Legal Services Commission. And I said, well, hang on, let me make it absolutely clear here. The rules are, if you're going to offer me a job and we're negotiating, I'm off air. Because you can't both be on air on the ABC while you're negotiating with the government, you're trying to hold to account. So don't offer me a job unless you're absolutely sure there's no kind of, there's no foreplay here. We just get straight into it. And I went up, I saw the attorney, I said to him, Rob Hulls it was, I said, this is how it is, you know, there's, there's nothing here. If you're going to offer me a job, you offer it, and if I accept it, I'm off air from that day. Bang. And then I came and saw you. Do you remember? I do remember. I don't know what I said. Probably, probably <laughs> lied to you. You said, what are they offering you? And I said, they're offering me a five-year term and a whole lot of money. And you said, oh, well, that's fine. We'll offer you five years too. And we were always going to offer you a pay rise. <laughs> I don't think I said that. But yeah. <laughs> especially the pay rise bit. But if that's how you remember it, that's fine. And then you absolutely stopped me in my tracks because I decided to go. I talked to Jan about it and I said, look, this is not bad for a bloke who was at that stage turning 50 to have a five-year security of tenure and then at least, you know, I've got something to look forward to. And you said to me, word for word, and it stopped me in my tracks, you said, John, think about it this way. You're going to be driving to work in your government Commodore, <laughs> listening to someone else doing 8.30 on ABC Radio, and you're going to be shouting at the radio, telling them how to do the job. <laughs> you're not ready to leave. <clears throat> do you remember that? I do remember that. And That's probably because I'd been shouting at the radio <laughs> as I came into work early that morning. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, she's right. Mm. I knew you weren't ready to... Seriously, I do remember that conversation. I knew you were not ready to go. I understood the temptation, but I knew it wasn't right. I know what it's like to feel like you've still got another broadcast and another broadcast and another broadcast. Mm. And so then I had to ring Rob Hulls and say, look, whatever you're going to offer me, forget it, I'm not going to do it. And he said, did you just play me? <laughs> and I said, well, no, I wasn't playing you off against each other, but they have offered me a better contract and a paid rise and also the opportunity to take long service leave, which was unheard of, which is how I got six months off in order mm. to refresh. And that was the best thing I ever did, to take that six months where Jack and I... Jack? Where Jack and I drove to London. Jack? Uh, and I think the family's left. Does that say well, something? Jan has. She's, <laughs> she's packed it in. She's probably... Anyway, so I... Yeah, we, we got long service leave mm. as part of the deal, and I came back, and lots of people said, don't do that, don't take six months off, because you'll never get your mojo back. In fact, it was the opposite. It mm. gave me a whole new energy. So thank you, Sue Howard. Thank you, thank it's you, thank pleasure. you. my pleasure. Thank you, John Bowen. And much missed, very much missed. 17 minutes past nine, coming up, a man who, well, for at least the next couple of hours, I still have to call my boss, David Anderson, the boss, the managing director of the ABC. Fane's Farewell Show. No, sort well, I reckon you're a bit of a shock jock yourself. Oh, do you reckon? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm sure reckon I'm a failure as a shock jock, actually, Yeah, Marvin. you're a bit of a failure, in my opinion, but... <laughs> Eighteen minutes past nine. David Anderson is the managing director of the ABC and a man who I'm delighted to be able to welcome to the stage here at the Melbourne Town Hall for the FFS Fane's final show. Could you make him very welcome, please, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, thank you. I've got to be careful here because uh, I guess you can cancel my pass, cut my email and even stop my final pay going into the bank account if I'm too rude to you, can't you? Uh, well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I'll just hold that threat until we get to the end of the interview. But... So you've been in the job how long now? Uh, 12 months, just over 12 months, and I've been appointed since May. And so far, 
I'm not aware of you having had any bad media, any bad press, or sadly, despite our best efforts, any serious criticism. Oh, there's been a little bit, but, you know, that's to be expected, and I think that's all right. I, I need to be held to account like everybody else, so that's all right. And that's a terrific thing because it is very much within the ABC style that if we apply the blowtorch to other people, of course. we have to yeah. absolutely expect and understand when it's applied back to ourselves. Uh, you've been in touch with Michelle Guthrie much? Uh, no. I did, I did notice you had the current and former premiers up here. Do we have any former managing directors coming <laughs> on today? Is there, is, there, is there anyone here? <laughs> uh, look, I don't have her number and I don't have Jonathan Shire's number either. What were you doing when Jonathan Shire was in charge? Because uh -huh. you've been with the ABC how many years? 30. Yep. And you started out as? Well, I was in the mailroom in Adelaide and then I moved to Melbourne, lived in Melbourne for 20 years. Last time I was on this stage in the town hall, I was pushing pianos around as a staging assistant for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> uh, Can I just uh, say how <laughs> remarkable that is that the managing director of the ABC started in the mailroom? Hmm. I don't I think Michelle this? Guthrie even knew there was a male room. <laughs> she just thought magically things happened. Anyway, I shouldn't... I'm not being... Well, I am. I'm being petty, aren't I? It's your last show, John. You yeah. Can, you know, it... So, no, the, I mean, there's... It, it's a, I mean, Sue said before she doesn't miss the politics, and it is an intensely political job. Hmm. It certainly is. Uh, but what is important about it is that when you're in this role, whoever is in this role that you do have an open dialogue with all sides of politics and uh, you have to actively pursue that because they don't really just invite you in. You need to uh, be walking the halls of, of Parliament House and then outside of sitting weeks you need to be able to be prepared to meet them. You need to have an open dialogue, be prepared to receive feedback uh, such that when uh, crisis moments happen that you've already got a bit of a rapport with whoever it is, any parliamentarian, uh, so you can discuss the matters that are important to the Australian people through the ABC. So that's the politics externally, but what about internally? There's vicious sometimes politics internally over who gets the money and who gets the time and all that stuff. I don't know about vicious, but oh, I, ha I have to say on. that, oh, look, I'm, I am surrounded by good people who are all very passionate about the ABC continuing to do the good things that it does, working with the community that in, in, in the public interest and serving the Australian people. Uh, so, of course, that comes with a little bit of passion of... Um, uh, a little bit of tribalism, maybe, over, over who, who gets what amount of money. And, but they're, they're all for virtuous reasons. They're all looking to expand. I heard a former Premier say earlier, can we bring back state-based... Uh, state uh, well, well, current affairs on television. Uh, I think that was a former Liberal uh, Premier and would point to the fact that our funding has recently been reduced uh, by a coalition government, which makes it hard to... Uh, expand into television. So, And just yesterday, in fact, you held a staff town, what's called a town hall meeting. This is a town hall meeting too, but a yep. different kind. And you broke the news to people that next year it's going to be extremely difficult and the bent belts are all going to be tightened another notch. Look, I'm still very confident about the ABC succeeding into the future and it doesn't really matter who's in government and, and what happens. I think that uh, the ABC's principal purpose, uh, the remit that we have and the, and the way that we approach this, we'll, we, we are resilient. We have been over many years. We've had many success stories uh, through difficult times and I think we'll continue to do that. But there is the reality of, uh, at the moment, having a, a, another situation where we do need to find money and that $84 million over three years really results in uh, a recurrent saving that needs to be found of $40 million a year from year three. When someone's come into your office and said, oh, there's another complaint about John Fain, what was your reaction? I was totally expected, John. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'd be surprised if that didn't happen. I would think that perhaps you're off your game. Uh, it, uh, look, I mean, I, I think... It, do you think that perhaps you might be the most complained about presenter? I have uh, been I, told that. Yeah. yeah. We've sent that off to RMIT Fact Check. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I haven't had the results yet. I, um, look, I don't know. We, we didn't invite Her Senator Erica Betts from Tasmania to come and join us at the town hall today, but I'm sure, like other opportunities, he would have grabbed the chance, as have several others, to uh, use every chance, to every opportunity to apply the blowtorch, and that is fine. That's what we're there for. Um, but the relations between the, uh, the ABC 
as a corporate entity and the government are very different to the relations between individual presenters or programs and the government, of course. I mean, you don't tell us what to do. Uh, I don't tell you what to do. No. no. no I'm, 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 you don't tell anyone what to do. In fact, for the record, I've been at the ABC in 30 years on Radio National, on television and on local radio. No one has ever told me to do something or not to do something on air. Off air, totally different. But you comply with the guidelines. That's right. Knock yourself out. So we have fairly robust editorial policies and we have a statutory obligation to be impartial and accurate at all times. Uh, and all of our people know that. And we have editorial management that, that sits beneath us. I mean, there, there, are, there is so much that we do. Uh, and I really do enjoy explaining this to any parliamentarian where uh, they might think they know the ABC and they know part of the ABC, but to explain that we're in every state and territory capital, we're in 48 regional locations doing local radio with a presence that represents regional and rural Australia, uh, and then all the facets that we do both online as well as on broadcast, uh, it, there really is quite a lot, so it would be really impossible for anyone to be telling anybody what to do all the time. Now we've got a, um, a, a musical guest joining us. We do. We're going to be joined by Sammy Jays pretty soon, who's going to give us some of your career highlights and song. But just before we do that, just before we do that, um, I, I have something to present to you, John. Says the managing director, holding up a very large. Th this is this is not a. Um, so so for listeners, I'm is holding. This, is this my my final pay? No. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was worrying that you would think that this is a big prop check. Uh, it's not. Uh, so for, for those uh, of you that, you know, so John has been for the ABC over a 30 year period, but uh, uh, again, the RMIT fact check comes back that it's 23 years. Now at 25 years, you qualify for a medallion. Uh, 25 so years service medallion. I've been with the ABC for four, five, six, seven years, and then not for a year, and then back for 23. So if you don't give me my 25 years service medallion, I'm going to be really pissed off. Well, I'm not. Uh, so this is, um, this is an encouragement <laughs> award uh, that we're giving you. Uh, <laughs> And I can't give you a real medallion, but I, but I have a, a mock-up oh, as well, uh, so uh, that's for you as well. So that's a chocolate dollar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, thank you, and, and, and sincerely, thank you for um, always turning up to work uh, with principle and purpose in the public interest, always doing it for the community. We are the last town square when it comes to holding conversations that matter. You um, interviewing people, holding them to account, providing that valuable context that people need to know and that need to know why things are important to them. So thank you again. Thank you. David Anderson, the Managing Director of the ABC. Ladies and gentlemen, Sammy Jay. John. John Fain, how are you feeling right now? Yeah, good, good, good. You feel the love in the room? Is this all about to come crashing down, is it? Oh, no, I just wanted to ask you how you're feeling, because that feeling right now of being appreciated and valued and loved, that's the same feeling that John Farnham felt during his first farewell tour. <laughs> so I think you might have started something, John. Now, I've, I'm not going to keep you long. Right. I've been locked in the basement of the ABC for the last three weeks. Have you yep. been to the basement of the ABC? Yeah, I park the car there every now and again. Yeah. There's nothing much there, just your car and the old desk from Late Line and Michelle Guthrie cutting out novelty checks. And um, <laughs> I've been doing some st st statistics, John. Yeah. I want to run you through some numbers, if I may. One show, three hours and 30 minutes. Per week, 17 hours and 30 minutes. Per year, 753 hours. Over 23 years, 17,308 hours on air, or two years of continuous talking. <laughs> Yep. So, of those 17,308 hours, John Fain, you have spent, and I listened to every single episode at high speed, so I do know this, <laughs> the 392 hours listening to talkback callers ask you how you are before asking their damn question, <laughs> 698 hours discussing fence disputes with David Whiting, <laughs> 437 hours thanking people for their contribution despite vehemently disagreeing with everything they just said, <laughs> A staggering 1,600 hours cunningly steering conversation towards vintage cars. <laughs> and get this, 837 hours saying what, what, what instead of World Wide Web. <laughs> Which... No, I'm... 
I'm sorry to break it to you, John. I know you are an intellectual powerhouse, but that's the same number of syllables as saying World Wide Web. <laughs> You're not saving us time. Now, I want to drill deeper, if I may, John. May I go deeper? You've spent 27 minutes being winked at by Tony Abbott. <laughs> Once on air, and the other 26 minutes, he was just outside the studio being a creep. Um, you've said the word astonishing 19,360 times. How would you describe that fact, John? Overwhelming. <laughs> And uh, I've also noticed that of your 17,000 hours on air, over 4,000 hours were comprised of dramatic silences during your opening monologue. I mean, it's basically lazy. You know, half your career has just been... Friday morning, 11th of October. <sighs> A council has approved an astonishing new policy. Do you want the truth on why that happens? Why? Usually because the screen's crashed and I'm waiting for it to come back. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure funding will cover that shortly. <laughs> Percentages now, John. Okay, 21% of your time has been spent steamrolling nervous public servants. 33% of your time pissing off arrogant politicians. 48% of your time being perfectly reasonable. 57% of your time being stubbornly unreasonable. 73% of your time providing a compassionate ear to people in need. And 100% of your time being one of the best damn broadcasters this country has ever produced. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. And the other reason for the pauses in the intro is sometimes so the 10 second delay can build up so that you can dump people when they say appalling things. Now, Sammy will be back. In fact, I think you're going to be doing the roving mic. Aren't yes, you? there's no talk back today. So I am the phone line today. Think of it like the 90s with a physical line, and I'm the um, receptacle. So if you want to say anything to John at all, and we'll make sure he doesn't press the dump button, put your hand up. I'll find you over the coming hours uh, once again. Thanks for your friendship, your guidance, and your wisdom. John Fain, my friend. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Now, 29 minutes to 10. Coming up after the news headlines, a bunch of people who I've been really horrible to for a whole lot of times on a lot of occasions. I'm going to try and say sorry to them. Should be interesting. At the Weather Bureau, Tom Delamotte's on duty at the Bureau. Morning to you, Tom. Good morning, John. Is it going to rain this evening? Because we've got a few people dropping around for a barbecue. <laughs> uh, if you're in the outer northern and eastern suburbs, slight chance you'll pick up a shower this afternoon, uh, but for much of the Melbourne area, really a, a partly cloudy day, uh, dry conditions, and uh, easterly winds, they will get fresh and gusty about the outer eastern suburbs as we go into tonight, uh, heading up to a maximum of 19 degrees, and we're currently sitting on 12.3 in the city. And across the weekend, uh, we see a partly cloudy day once again tomorrow. Slight chance of a shower around, uh, particularly about those northern and eastern suburbs once again, but it does clear up in the evening. Uh, so after a minimum of nine, get up to a maximum of 19 degrees. And then on Sunday, partly cloudy once again, slightly warmer with a maximum of 22. And uh, unfortunately, we can't get away from those partly cloudy conditions at the start of next week. Uh, partly cloudy for Monday and Tuesday, 24 on Monday, but down to 18 on Tuesday. And then it looks like we'll see uh, potentially some more interesting weather or, I guess, uh, active weather move in during the middle of the week uh, with a change coming across. So 17 degrees and showers around on Wednesday and uh, continuing with those showers on Thursday. Thank you, Tom. Tom Delamotte on duty at the Bureau and in the newsroom back at the South Bank headquarters, the excellent peerless newsreader Tim Callanan with the headlines. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, John. For the second last time, the United Nations is divided over its response to Turkey's military intervention in northern Syria. European countries are demanding a halt to military action and Syrian ally Russia is calling for restraint and direct dialogue between the two countries. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says military action is not the answer. One of the alleged victims of former school principal Malka Leifer says she'll meet the Prime Minister to discuss attempts to extradite Ms Leifer. The Israeli citizen is facing 74 charges of sexual assault in Victoria, but has been fighting extradition on mental health grounds. Israel's Supreme Court has now overturned her bail, ensuring she'll stay in jail until the extradition process is finished. And the Transport Department will monitor the expansion of 40 km per hour zones in central Melbourne. The City of Melbourne's 10-year transport plan also includes new bike lanes and making more space for pedestrians. 
Partly cloudy with possible afternoon showers today in Melbourne, a top of 19 degrees. It's 12 degrees now. More news at 10 o'clock. John Fain's farewell show. Now, sure, every time you tinker with the plan, every time you try and change it, it costs money. But this is already billions and billions of dollars of shitty city-shaping infrastructure. Apologies for that. (laughs) Oh, dear, thank you. I told you there were lots of ambushes coming from my producers, and that's yet another one. Ah, there were worse things. There was the time Miriam Margulies dropped the C-bomb live to air in the studio on the Conversation Hour, and because it was the Conversation Hour, we were not in delay. Ah, oh, no one complained. Not one complaint. Absolutely extraordinary. 25 minutes to 10, John Fain in the Melbourne Town Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, make a noise. We haven't heard from you for a while. Now, I... I thought there were a few people who I needed to apologise to and very publicly and on stage. We'll get to Sammy J who's out and about in the crowd. There he is, he's got the microphone and he's going to come and have a chat to some of you. And then we're also going to meet not just the first two people who had their, well, early journalism careers completely crueled by being asked to produce me back in 1997, but also we will be welcoming to the stage Virginia Trioli for a bit of a handover. So all of that's got to be done in this half hour. But on the stage with me here, Jerome Weimar from now Transport Services at the Department of Transport, <laughs> Kristen Hilton, Victoria's Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner, Lindley Marshall, the CEO of Museums Victoria, and Tony Elwood, Director of the National Gallery of Victoria. And thank you all very much for coming along. <laughs> Jerome, if I could start with you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I don't accept the apology. (laughs) How long is it now that you've been coming in every month? Uh, Probably about four years now. And I've been occasionally horrible. Uh, No, you've been horrible every single time. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's unfair. That's very unfair. But that's all right. I'll give it to you. Well done. Well played. (laughs) Um, You've got a commitment to engaging with the community, which means you kind of borrow the transmitter from time to time in order to get your message across. Congratulations. It's a great thing to do. Look, and I think, think in in all honesty, radio is the best medium to have the conversation. The the, the call-ins we get every month give us a direct line into what people are worrying about, and there are many things that that people are saying about their transport system, and it's right that we are there to be accountable and to, uh, to try and fix it. But sometimes it means that there are people who are having a go at you, including me. Yeah. Do you, can you distinguish between it's business, not personal? Uh, look, of, of course you do. And um, look, I think the, the, the integrity, John, of what you do on, on, on the show is that you care about the city and the people who phone in care about the city and care about their experience of, of getting around the city. And I think that's, that's what makes it worthwhile. That's what makes it such an important conversation. This isn't just people having a pop for the sake of it. They care about how, how their city's going and, uh, and it's an honour to be, to be in a position to try and do something about that. Kristen Hilton, from the point of view of the Equal Opportunity Commission, you're trying to both be a regulator and a complaint service, but at the same time do some uh, preventative work, I suppose. How useful is the radio to you in that role? Well, it's incredibly useful because, as Jerome said, it allows you to have really connect with people across the state and to have a discussion about the things that matter to them. I mean, when we talk about human rights and equality, partly we're talking about the laws that regulate those things, but... A respect for human rights is an attitude that you bring to the type of community that you want to be, a community that cares about respect and kindness and equality. And I have to say, John, that I've always felt that you have had that spirit, even if, you know, we've contested things within the studio from time to time and there's been difficult callers. But that's one of the things that I'm very proud about in this city and this state, that many people believe in that sort of compassion and and the basic human desire, which is to want to belong. Um, And I should say, just on the um, 23 years that you've been on radio, I come from a small town in country Victoria, uh, Kyabram. Is anyone here from the Golden Valley? Oh, look, there's a few hands. Yay! Um, So we spent a lot of time travelling up and down the Hume Highway from Kyabram to Melbourne, and there were many times where my mum would yell at you on the radio. Uh, What's what's your mum's name? Kerry. Kerry. She's going to be mortified. I am so sorry. And then, and then, 
and then we'd belt out some Patsy Cline, but invariably <laughs> we would turn you back on. And I think that that's that draw that you've had on people where they have felt that, yes, you'll get an even hearing and you are someone that cares about the public interest in this state. Well, this applies equally to Lindley Marshall and to Tony Elwood still coming too. Nothing would be more boring than if you came on air, Kristen, or Lindley or Tony, and we all just furiously agreed with each other. So sometimes... I say stuff I don't really mean or believe because I know that's astonishing, isn't it? But it makes for a better conversation on the radio. So, yeah, I'm a passionate believer in human rights. Of course I am, as I am in the work of the museum. But if we're just going to get Lindley Marshall or Tony Elwood to come in and we're going to just say, oh, wow, aren't you fantastic, isn't it great? Well, you could hear the sound of radios being turned off all over Melbourne, couldn't you, Lindley? I don't know, John. I think um, what's, what's been wonderful about having the opportunity to come and chat with you on your show about what's happening at the museums is that the museums are such an integral part of you know, life here in Melbourne and Victoria. Millions of families come in every year and it's been really good to come in and chat with or argue with you about what's happening and what should happen and what shouldn't happen. And, and I think uh, people engage with that. Sure, but not wanting to be combative for its own sake, even though that's what I'm sometimes accused of. It's actually, no. it's actually about trying to get the best out of you. Yeah. Because if you come in and all you get is, you know, stock standard, well, Lindley, tell me, what's going on at the museum? Well, no one would bother listening. In, in, well, it's my view anyway. But if instead we say, look, you know, how are your numbers and how do we get more people in or why are you down or why won't the government give you more money or whatever it might be, that's going to have a different conversation. Doesn't that help? I think it does. I think it does. It gives us an opportunity to argue for funding, for example. We've had that conversation before. And I think, um, look, I think we do pretty well. I've just come back from overseas and I think Tony will agree with this. When you go away and you visit incredible institutions and have a look at what's happening over there and the wonderful thing is you come back knowing that, you know, our National Gallery, our State Library, our museums, um, the work that's happening here and what's being presented to the public is up there with the best you'll find anywhere. Would you agree with that? I do. Yeah. And, and yet I think we're under-museumed for a city that's now yeah, attracting so many that. tourists. So I do keep <laughs> saying that because I believe it and I think it's true. Tony, uh, occasionally I've had to come across as an anti-intellectual art-hating bogan in order to get the best out of a conversation. Correct. Yeah. And yet you've still agreed to come back and speak to me another time I and love another time and to another you, John, time. Because I know you, you also do love and value the arts in this city. You only have to look at the town hall to see this city's always had incredible ambition for itself when it comes to valuing humanities and valuing the arts and infrastructure around that. And uh, you've seen that you know, the museum and the gallery of the 21st century is about building communities, being inclusive, all the values that I think you also espouse, John. So um, thank you for all the support you've given us. It's a pleasure, but it's because... I mean, fundamentally, if you believe that the quality of life of a city is not just driven by whether the trains are on time, but about the cultural life, the civic life, the ideas that exchange that are flowing through the population yeah. in every moment, then if you believe that, then you have to actually put it into practice. Well, they often say it's the, the museums and galleries are the beating heart of the city. Yeah. And when people come into another city, what's one of the first things you do? You check out those kind of uh, places because they actually reflect the values of a city. Do you get enough... Well, dare I say this, do you get enough, not, I'm not going to ask you about money because I know your answer is going to be no, but do you get enough respect and time from the decision makers in order to at least put your case? Absolutely. Now, that, that's one of the uh, things that makes Melbourne stand out from the rest of the country because we've always had that across all sides of, of politics. Yeah, I really believe that. So you've got a microphone, each one of you. What do you want? Lindley, I'm giving you, uh, you know, the, the magic wand. People are listening. <laughs> what do we want? Yeah, what do you want? Well, look, I think that uh, we want a continuation of the support that we've got, and when it is possible, we do need more funding. There's no question. We're not going to let that one go, are we, Tony? Hell no. No. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. Uh, but we are very grateful for the support that we get from the state and from Creative Victoria and from the people of Victoria. Um, our visitors are just our greatest asset and just a joy to us. So we want more of them too. And when do the Terracotta Warriors finish? This weekend. We're open until 10 o'clock uh, Saturday and Sunday. 
Hurry, hurry, <laughs> hurry, ladies and gentlemen. Jerome, you couldn't possibly want more money. You've got more money coming into your <laughs> coffers than you know how to spend. Oh, you can always have more, John. You can always have more. The, the more of the same. And we're, we're, we're going through a space where we've never had so many people coming to our city. We have never had so many trains and trams and buses running. But we need to do more to keep the growth of Melbourne and Victoria going. So we have a huge job to do. Uh, and we have some big grown-up decisions to make. The, uh, you know, the City of Melbourne strategy this morning point us in that direction of some big decisions about how we're going to live together as a city and to keep the beating heart going as, uh, as Tony's described. And Kristen, your magic wand? Well, I want us to stop uh, confusing political correctness with human decency. Um, I... It's a, it's a term that just gets bandied around too much. It's hollowed out of meaning and actually what it... I mean, people reflect on a... or have nostalgia for a period when it was OK to be homophobic and racist and sexist. And I don't know if that was such a, a great time in our society. So I want us to continue to care and be kind and be respectful and understand that there's kind of a wind blowing and it's up to us to stay on top of it. I thank you all, and I also want to acknowledge Kate Tawney from the State Library, a former colleague, like Lindley, is actually from back at the ABC, and uh, we wish Kate all the best and hope that she's back at work very soon, and she would have also been very much a valued contributor up here on this panel. But a thank you each, every one of you. Could you please thank Jerome Weimar from Transport, Kristen Hilton from the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Committee, Lindley Marshall from the Museum, Tony Elwood from the National Gallery, who have very kindly given up some of their morning in order to come here and say hello to me today. And thank you indeed, and I look forward to seeing you all at some point as well. Now, Sammy J was threatening to go and do uh, little chats with people in the crowd. Morning to you, Sammy J. Who have you got? Uh, John, I'm a man of my word. I will make good on that threat. I've discovered a lovely man named uh, Stuart who wants to grill you. Stuart, please. I'm going to hold the mic, not you, just in case. <laughs> thank you, Sammy. Um, since the news of your departure, there's been, I understand there's been a resurgence in support and morale at the Collingwood Football Club. <laughs> Have you got any views on the idea, we're talking about religious discrimination, what about discrimination on the basis of supporting teams? Okay, so here we go. Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? You all have to join. One, two, three. Go Pies! No, John. So there you are, Stuart. There's your answer. The I... people have spoken. I'm hitting the dump button on that one, John. But uh, sorry, just... and Reynold McDonald over here, a predecessor of mine on the radio, who is also a previous president of the Collingwood Football Club, is sitting there and arms crossed. The body language tells you everything. He's gritting his teeth. He's pretending to smile, but inside he's being eaten up. Aren't you, Reynold? Absolutely. Sorry, Sammy. No, don't be sorry at all. John, um, I've just seen someone sitting right here. You often no, say... No, can you find you... someone else? I don't think no, you should no, talk no, to that you, man. No, you, 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 no, 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 no. No, This is a Sammy. man... This is no, John. I'm sorry to overrule you, you did, but this is a you man You didn't who... ask me about this. Well, I have deal no... with it, John. You've got two hours left and you'll... <laughs> Uh, you often say that you just do the talking and the production team do a lot of the hard work. This is a man who's done a lot of hard work for you over the years, I believe, Daniel Ziffer. Yeah, but he knows all the bad secrets and things. Uh, hi, um, Dan Ziffer, uh, senior producer, long-time senior producer, first-time caller. Um... <laughs> Hello, Dan. Hello, Dan. Doubly welcome. Depending uh, on what you're about to say. I know that there's been a lot of thank yous and congratulations from people today. And so on behalf of all the producers and the people you've worked with, I just want to say, let's get to some content. Um, <laughs> I've got two questions, a serious one and a flippant one. Um, you have been doing this a long time. Ideas in society change of what's acceptable and, and what is normal. You're trying what's, to be serious. Yeah. What's, it's never, what's been, been, never been your strongest suit. I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, across that time, what's been the issue that has shifted the most in the public from being completely unacceptable and fringe to completely accepted? That's a good question, and you're very good at good questions too. Can I just make... I, I will be thanking producers before, and there are a lot of them. There's a lot of people whose lives I've ruined. And Dan... Uh, while Dan worked for me, I think we should apologise to Asha, his uh, long-suffering partner and mother of two gorgeous children who were born, well, no, conceived despite the work hours <laughs> that, that Dan put in time. for how long? Five years. For five years. It was remarkable. Uh, to answer your question, 
I think that one of the things that's changed obviously is environment, but I don't want to uh, just devote the entire answer to that. I think the other thing that's changed at the moment, we're really seeing it and significantly seeing it, is people's attitude to, to civics, to democracy. And I'm astonished, I don't understand it. People are starting to question something that was never questioned before. You know, one of the reasons I think why Jeff Kennett lost power was because he was, you know, getting rid of the Auditor General and the DPP and he was attacking the judiciary and he was having a go at some of the foundations and the, you know, the pillars of, of Westminster democracy. And these days people now are saying, well, you know, that Donald Trump, he's not a bad bloke, you know, he gets stuff done and so on. And that's happening all over the world. I'm, I'm flabbergasted, but you can't, you can't miss it, you can't avoid it. Actually, I got them the wrong way around. That was the flippant one. This is the serious one. Um, soon, Melbourne will be the largest on, city in I've Australia. I've so wanted to do this to a producer, and I finally got the chance. Melbourne will soon be the largest city in Australia. How do we best extract our revenge? <laughs> Through our quality of life, our quality of life. Dan, thank you very much. Sammy, thank you as well. Plenty still to come, including another former producer of mine who is going to interview me properly, and that's Chris Yulman, who worked for me for a long time. And Chris is going to come up here and put me through my paces, which will be quite funny, I might say. But with me on the stage here at the Town Hall, 10 minutes to 10 on the FFS, Fame's final show on ABC Radio Melbourne, Prani West and Glenn Bartholomew. Prani West was my first senior producer. She now works as a lawyer at Minta Ellison. Glenn Bartholomew was on the team as Prani's senior assistant producer and now is heard around Australia on news radio. Glenn, thank you for coming along. Prani. Wonderful Lovely to see you, you John. Um, again, I'm full of apologies for people today. Thank you both very much for putting up with me back in, what was it, 97? In, indeed. Uh, you, the, the first of the many series of producers that you tortured. And um, uh, I, I was noticing you, you mentioned uh, uh, birth rates there. there. There was, I think, that chair, that producer's chair was yep. actually some sort of fertility stool because there um, <laughs> appeared to be a series of producers who circled through that and, uh, and then left to have babies. I so stayed I right know. away from that. You thing. did. <laughs> uh, I, I often, I in fact, started to wonder if they were having babies in order to have a way out <laughs> as a dignified way of saying I'm out of here. It could well be, yeah, yeah. perhaps that was right. But look, John, w when we started, um, you certainly said, uh, and the first thing you said on, on day one was, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And you've, you've really made that. You, you've become the Rob DiCostella of, of ABC Radio. And uh, uh, the, the runners are off now. And uh, I hope that you're going to take a well and rest. You did get a medal in the end, didn't you? I think you got presented I, with one. So I, think it's a, I think it's a chocolate coin. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> But w when we started, we faced the interesting challenge because, of course, while you were uh, well known within the ABC to the, the wider audience and, and the potential interviewees in this um, important time slot, it was something of an uphill battle, I suppose, in persuading people to come across and do regular interviews with you and, and trust the forum as, as getting their word and, and you know, communications across. Um, and uh, I know that we, you know, uh, commandeered a number of, uh, of high-profile individuals to do regular gigs on the program. Um, Peter Costello, I think, spring, springs to mind. I think yep. one, one particular interview we, uh, we, was his birthday. We actually gave him a, a birthday cake. I think we gave him a donut from the cafeteria. That's right. yes. And there was a mad panic to see if we could find a candle. To, to go on it, To yes. go in one candle inside a cheap ABC cafe yeah. donut. <laughs> But I think, well, I don't know, he doesn't really return my calls anymore, but I don't think it's because of that. No, no. I, I, Jeff, though, does, doesn't return your calls, does he? No. I mean, there's been well, a bit, few mentions about that, and of course... We'll... Well, you, you used to be able to get Jeff Kennett to come to the studio because you were very close to his press secretary, Steve Correct. Murphy. Correct. Yes, that's right. And, uh... Did Jeff ever, or Steve Murphy, ever say to you afterwards, why do we bother doing this? Uh, they... There was certainly a sentiment to that effect after that uh, famous interview. <laughs> <laughs> it must be said it was something of a, a frosty environment in the control booth after that particular one, when do he left his cup of tea just sitting on the end of your desk. Do you remember what he said as he left the studio that day, either of you? Remember which? 
what, what Jeff Kennett said Please. as he left the studio after the cup of tea interview, and I said to him on air, um, as I said to Mr Brax, good luck, win, lose or draw, and he said thank you, and then he said as he went out the door, he said, at least if, at least if I lose, I'll never have to talk to you again. Yes. <laughs> Now, Glenn, you've gone on to a stellar career with ABC Radio, including on News Radio. You're heard right around the country. Uh, how much earlier would you have got to that role if you hadn't been producing me? <laughs> if only I knew what I know now. Uh, but, listen, I think Prani's right in the sense that you came in yet, like, let's face it, every production team has heard that mantra, a marathon, not a sprint. But along with it was, it's got to be fun. I think that was the difference between you getting the axe the first time and coming back and realising this has to be sustainable. And sustainable was a key word because people need to remember that this occurred in 1997. A bit of deja vu for everybody here, perhaps, is that it came after the, the budget cuts under Richard Alston, the communications minister of the Howard government. And so the two morning shows got collapsed. The Couchman program previously that I worked on up until 10 o'clock, and there's a separate program, 10 till 12. Prana used to do a regional program 11 to 12. Those programs disappeared. The program got merged into the mother of all programs it is now. We had very little cash. We had to just literally make up a format that would be sustainable. And you came up to your credit with the idea of that conversation hour program that would go 11 to 12, get some conversation our hosts in to do the work and prop you up in that final hour as you started to fade with uh, weariness over that period. Good thinking. <laughs> Spent all their money on that with the remarkable Neil Davey in charge of that. So Cameron Burgess, Prani and me, they're sort of trying to make this thing up literally as we went along some time. We broke the rules. We did things wrong, but we had a lot of fun and that was the, the key to it. You come off every day and thank the producers individually, something that I've taken with me everywhere I've gone, to say, listen, you've got to know, and I know you've said this on air, that they really run the show, they really drive the show. Producers can keep serving it up, but someone needs to hit it. And you hit it out of the park a lot of times. So the key was to be able to just roll with it. I remember us doing broadcasts from the water, the oh, Almadopal in that yes. ship, uh, Omeo for the bushfires, uh, of course, the Anzac Day, the Melbourne Cup, the traditions, all of that stuff. We all showed up and did it over and over again. But do you remember when we did the Melbourne Cup broadcast and we got Gabriel Gatte to come and talk about eating horse? <laughs> we were always very creative. Just looking for I, a new angle. Indeed. I, I, remember, I remember the show at the Royal Melbourne show, and I know you've had a lot of you know, reptiles you're on not, the program over the, <laughs> over the journey, but... I've never forgiven you for this. That snake, yes, a large python that was draped around... Uh, I got uh, John out of the, the caravan and he was standing there and... The, the wrangler of this snake draped this massive python around your neck and I will never forget the look on John's face because he was so horrified to see this thing. The dry cleaning bill was huge, I might say. <laughs> and that was the same day when the transmitter broke down. We were halfway through a broadcast and suddenly it dropped out and Ian Tritt, who sadly just died a few months ago, Tritty, one for you, and uh, just as it dropped out, Tritty went, oh, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong, the effing thing's just shit itself. And at that, <laughs> at that precise moment, it came back on. That was Cameron. <laughs> that was Cameron. I think he even had a T-shirt with that written on it yeah. after a while. Cameron sure. Burgess, yeah. Okay. Great debut on air, Cam. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, I've, I've got to wriggle on. Got to get a wriggle on. Prani, thank you very much. It's great to see you. John, it's been wonderful to see you. Prani West, who by all accounts anyway, always set the highest bar in the fashion states at the ABC <laughs> regardless. And Glenn Bartholomew, I thank you both very, very much. Now, Sammy J, what have you got for us? John, I've, um, I've just seen someone who's put her hand up and she seems to want to think she can somehow ask you a question, almost as if she's going to try and do your job. It's Virginia Trioli, my Ladies friend. and gentlemen... <laughs> Now, this is, um, there are two things, Virginia, that we have to do. There are two things we have to do. One of them I have to do, but I have to do it while you're watching. Is this thing on? Hello, everyone. Good morning. So happy to be here. So happy to be here. I have here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, not another alarm clock. I, 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 have here, I have here an alarm clock. All right. And what are you setting it to? And... <laughs> hey! if, if only I could, dear friends, if only I could. And that's something you can look forward to. It's now squashed and dead on the floor of the stage. Well done, John. I also have here a red wire 
basket, the sort that you see in a stationery shop. It's an in-basket. Yeah. It's an in-basket and it's been with me for 23 years. <laughs> I also have a pen around my neck, but I know asking Virginia to start wearing a pen around her neck is a complete waste of time. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and we've gone from one extreme to the other because I am daily pretty shabby and you are highly and super elegant. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask you, but I gift to you. Ah, John. The sacred red basket. Twenty-three years in radio and all I got was a lousy in basket. <laughs> John, thank you. Um, of course, what we can't see inside this basket is the community that is you and that is this station and this program. People talk about radio as radio waves, but actually it's a meeting place. And you've showed that here today by turning up. And every time you tune in, you turn up. And what I want you to do is turn up and show up and bring your best arguments and your brightest ideas. Listen to others. Sue Howard's right. The contest of ideas is a cliche, but it's the only thing we have is actually to bring those competing ideas and to try and listen to each other and to try and move a little bit. If we're going to survive as a country, I think we have to. So please join me on Monday and do that. Virginia Trioli, and there's plenty more coming up after the 10 o'clock ABC News. Live from the Melbourne Town Hall, this is John Fain's Farewell Show on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. But first, Steve from Point Lonsdale's on the line. Good morning, Steve. John, I'm a bit concerned about Kevin Adner and his attitude towards Christianity. I can't see any Christian compassion. I'm dying an awful death. You're what, sorry? I'm dying an awful death of cancer. And I've probably oh, I'm got less than two sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. Not as sorry as I am, mate. I'm, I'm absolutely sure. I can't eat. I can't do anything. I'm as weak as a kitten. I can't even hang washing on the line. And I want my life to end. The situation at King Lake has been reported as serious and Peter Mitchell is at the fire station in King Lake. Peter, good evening. Oh, g'day, John. How are you? What can you tell us? Uh, the whole of King Lake is ablaze, mate. Um, I live a couple of k's out of town and I heard explosions. I just went to the end of my road to, uh, to see what was going on and by the time I got to the road there were fires everywhere and I just bolted back um, and... There was, I mean, I got a fire pump, but no way. I just thought, no, we won't fight this. Not a good morning. Friday, September the 28th. Our thoughts go out this morning to Tom Ma, to Jill's parents, to all of her family, her friends, our colleagues here at the ABC. I want to talk to you about Jill as a person, Jill as a colleague, and also what Jill's death has somehow come to mean. So, this morning, we'll pay our respects to our friend, our colleague, and there's a very empty space in our office this morning. Seven minutes past ten. It's quite hard for me to hear those, those calls. Um, Steve Guest whose call into the program to talk about that he was dying a terrible death and that triggered a whole debate that's led to the voluntary sister dying laws and the Black Saturday fires and, of course, the death of our friend and colleague, Jill Ma. They're the hardest things I've had to deal with, no doubt about it. But welcome back to the FFS, the fame final show at the Melbourne Town Hall. Here we are. It's 10 o'clock. Somehow got to get through to 12... Not quite sure how. You can see there's music coming up. There's all sorts of stuff still to come. Uh, as we put together today's final show, um, it was put to me that someone should interview me. And I uh, absolutely said no way, under no circumstances. And if you arrange for that, I will... I'll, I'll be sick that day. <laughs> and then it was put to me that Chris Yulman, who used to be one of my producers... Um, we did some difficult things together, that Chris Yulman would come and interview me on the stage, and then I said, OK, I'm up for that. That, in fact, would be an absolute privilege. Could you please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Channel 9's... <laughs> Channel 9's political editor and 
I can say absolutely a friend and esteemed former producer. I've had some fabulous people working for me. And Chris, welcome to you. Good to see you, mate. Just listening to that, though, I've got to say it's, it's often a bitter privilege to be a broadcaster at times like those. Have you ever questioned the way that you deal with some of those things? I can think we went to, together to Singapore uh, for the hanging of Van Trong Nguyen. Uh, you know, we were Melbourne, off- Melbourne man accused and convicted of smuggling drugs in Singapore. Did we do the right thing going there? Well, I don't know. It was the hardest thing I'd done until then. Uh, you and I, we were... Well, we'd, we'd done interviews with his mother as part of the attempt to get the Singaporean government to stop him being executed. So they said, oh, well, you guys have a relationship with the family. Off you go. You go to Singapore. You did incredible work lining up human rights activists and lawyers and people for us to interview. That but, was amazing. Well, I think we, we were sort of standing outside the, the prison and knowing that he was going to die that day and we were broadcasting from a BBC studio. It is one of those questions that I, it kept coming back to me. What profit for us to leave Melbourne to go to Singapore to do that, the intrusion versus the enlightenment, you know, what for you was the benefit in doing something like that? There was none for me, but was there for the cause of stopping capital punishment? Quite possibly. There was nothing good that could come from the death of that young man who, as we learned, went on a mission to smuggle drugs through Singapore to save his own brother who was indebted to to drug dealers and Vang Trong agreed that he would do the run if that meant they would forgive his brother his debts and not kill him. He got caught and then he was executed. Now, if, I don't know, do you think it moved the dial a little bit on capital punishment? If it did, then some good came from it, but it was gut-wrenching and I felt physically ill reporting it. Yeah, and it, I guess one of the things that I thought about it was if it stops one young person from doing something dumb, which is all he did. Yep. He did one dumb thing and he paid for it with his not life, not just the rest of his life. But the balance between the intrusion sometimes of what you do and, the, and offering the community some kind of insight, do you question those things? Do you go back to things? What, have you made mistakes? Huh, have I? <laughs> have I made mistakes, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Right, there's your answer. Every day, probably. Yeah, of course we do. If, if, I mean, if you, think you're not, if, if you think you never make mistakes, that's your first mistake. Because well, you do. The other thing, too, that I speak for all producers here, I know is that you're getting a lot of praise today, but the hashtag FFS is I know what a lot of producers yell at the glass, not to the actual <laughs> radio. Because can I tell you, and John Fain is one of my dearest friends, is an incredible pain in the arse. <laughs> Um, Have you always sorry. been an incredible pain in the ass, or did you develop that over time? What do you mean by pain in the ass? Can you just put some flesh on those bones? I remember the day that, that so, so Peter Costello used to come in to do a ritual sort of post-budget conversation with you. You went to law school together. It was the budget where he brought in the future fund. And we had an argument that ran all morning. Was John was very opposed to it. I thought it was a good idea. And then this continued on air. And it, it was a great thing that you have to pursue a question to its limits. But when Costello said for the fifth time, John, do you want me to do it or do you want me not to do it? And we asked the same question again. I thought, (laughs) FFS. There were other things in this budget. Yeah, you thought it should have been Fane's final show right about then and (laughs) there. Yeah, right about then. (laughs) No, it was was always in line. Look, the thing I have always admired about you is your ability to ask the mongrel question. But again, have you ever asked one of those where you yourself thought as it came out of your mouth, "Mm, tad too far? You bet. Any stand out? Yep. Uh, well, and... share. <laughs> uh, well, you know, just, what was it? Uh, was it yesterday? Yes, it was. Bill Shorten, are you a broken man? Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the question we all want an answer to. Is, has, he, has he bounced back? And his answer, which he gave, was to laugh and go, no, of course I'm not a broken man, but it was so unconvincing. Do you forget and that they're the... people, though, sometimes? Do you forget they're well, human beings? you have to. Because if you're going to treat them as if you're their counsellor or their friend, well, forget it. You might as well pack it in because you're not. And if it's ever a choice between being liked or being respected, you have to be respected. Is public life too bitter now? I mean, I I have the advantage now of having seen it from both sides because my wife was a member for Canberra for nine years and I saw the... For the... Which party? Seat of Canberra for the Labor Party. For the Labor Party. And yet you're accused of being a sort of, you know, neo-fascist half the time. Yeah, no, you know... Sad but true. 
mostly by people who listen to the ABC. But uh, it's kind of love-hate relationship. But, yeah, has, has politics become too bitter? Are we incapable of talking to each other anymore? And that's one of the real... I have genuine concerns about that, and I think that the, the tone and the calibre of public debate has sometimes very much become diminished. I hope I haven't contributed to that. In fact, I've always tried to concentrate on substance rather than personalities. The bitterness, I, I, though, I, I experienced firsthand with you was behind the scenes again in 2005. You showed me a letter that had been sent to you, uh, which accused you of being a self-loathing Jew. Uh, the anti-Semitism, which I had never really appreciated until I sat with you for a year. Uh, do you get that still? Oh, yeah. There's barely a day when you don't get subjected to some form of abuse. It's a strange job where you go to work knowing that you're going to be subjected to that sort of nonsense on the text line or you get mail that, you know, by and large, you'd rather not have seen. Uh, I got one yesterday. Someone wrote to me furious because of something I'd said the other day about fruit bats. And fruit bats? Yeah. <laughs> Is there no subject where you can't get hate? Yeah. <laughs> and I said I thought they were smelly, disease-ridden, yeah, revolting Yeah, shoot them. They don't belong in Victoria. Yeah. And... Uh, this is someone who loves fruit bats. And yeah, well, wrote, there's plenty of them north of the border. Wrote me a letter singing the praises of the fruit bat and actually suggesting that if there was someone who was smelly, vile and could be eradicated, it was me. <laughs> Can I say you have scrubbed up well today, mate? <laughs> and I've never seen so many ABC radio people so well dressed. Look at this, they're wearing suits. <laughs> this is a completely unnatural experience. <laughs> I, I, I think they're kind of doing it in order to just make the point that we never do it. ABC leans to the left. Do we? Well, do you? No. We, well, if we lean to the left, we then also lean to the right. But I'm wearing a pink shirt today. What does that mean? Well, it's not blue, it's pink. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a sort of socialist colour, though, isn't it? Don't you miss the ABC? Because now you're, you're over there with Channel 9. Oh, look, uh, and, and yes, I do. And what I miss most of the ABC are all of my mates who, uh, you know, over such a long period of time, and good to see so many of them here today. And look, I didn't leave the ABC for altruistic reasons, but I did need to move on. I, you know, risk is an important thing in life. But can I say, and you know, uh, the ABC is a tremendously important institution. But so is commercial news media, and commercial news media now faces pressures which the ABC cannot imagine. Uh, we are being devoured by inter uh, internet behemoths which we can't compete with, that not just get the advertising dollars but also reproduce what we do. So we are now in an age of tremendous flux, and one of the tremendous pieces of flux is, flux. is social that, media. Sorry, that was flux. It was flux. Yeah. Right. I'm very careful with my words. Yeah. Um, but, but, John, what do you think about the rise of social media? How has that affected your job? There are pros and cons. You can see it on the screen in front of you. You get immediate responses from people. But yeah. has it debased public debate? Yeah, I think we're going through a bit of a transition. And I don't think this is going to be eternal. I think this is just uh, a phase. And at the risk of repeating myself, quoting myself, and becoming tedious and boring, it's too late for that now. But... Uh, when the motor car was invented, 1895, Daimler and Benz, the internal combustion engine was applied to the horse's carriage. It's always carriage, cars, isn't it? Always cars. And then it took another 10 to 15 years before the regulations that went with cars came around. You know, licences, regulations for uh, how you, what happened if two horseless carriages bumped into each other on the road. Um, things like road rules and then insurance, and we're going through that now. So we've got this life-changing technology, social media, and it's going to take 10 years or so before they are properly regulated and they're given their proper place. Now, I have deep respect for producers because Katrina yeah, will waiting. give you the hook in just winding, a moment. Winding uh, up. Yeah, just a quick couple of quick questions. How, how many cars do you actually own? So it's time for the news. Look at that, 17 minutes <laughs> past time. Are they all internal combustion engines, by the way? None of them are electric, are they? Correct. Do you drive them a lot? The ones that go. Should you drive them less? Why? How many do you have, John? Just answer the question. Just a few, and I'm more than... Just more than... answer the question. No, I won't. It's... <laughs> There's a few, and some of them go, and some of them don't, but I hope soon I'll have time to make them all well, go. Well, can I just say, as we you can only this, drive I one at a time. your non-answer of that question speaks volumes, John. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. It does. It tells you that I'm a car enthusiast, and that means, like any other car enthusiast, you've got a few little... One last thing. One of the things that we did do uh, on the, in 2005 was introduce a uh, part of the program called The Wrap. We did, and you, you insisted on putting people from the IPA I on, did. on air. Yeah. yeah, I thought it would be nice to hear a you know, different point of view on the, on the radio yeah. and have a bit of a contest of ideas, which is what people...
people want. So you, say, you secretly are an IPA plant at the ABC? Well, I, look, I've been accused of it. I might as well admit it on air right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, they pay extremely poorly. Uh, but can I say that the, the one huge frustration about that was trying to settle on a name for it. And you kept coming up with ideas that you thought were great. Uh -oh. And my favourite was Bubble and Squeak. <laughs> and I, remember, I am saying I am not putting anything on the air that's called <laughs> Bubble and Squeak. So happily it still exists as the rap, which is a much better name and wasn't your idea. And it was yours. Thanks, mate. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Yulman from Channel 9, political commentator extraordinaire, and one of those who... One of those many people who I'm very blessed to have worked with. 19 minutes past 10, uh, surprise guests coming up shortly, but on stage you will see, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are here in the hall, and those of you who aren't, who are listening to us on the radio, my former colleague and still rock and roll star, the wonderful Claire Bowditch. Could you welcome her with Monique de Martino on the keyboards? Thank you. Thank you so much. John, this song, Imagine, you chose it. Why this song? Uh, you asked me if I had a request, and I said, oh, something Beatles, and you said, which one? And I said, oh, let it be, no. And then I changed my mind, and I said, imagine, because basically I'm just an ageing hippie. I think there's something about foresight and dreaming that's in, in that for all of us. So if you wouldn't mind singing along, I think we can celebrate you, John Fain. We all know the words, and if not, we just mime. It's going to be great. It goes a little something like this, with love. Has everybody got their notes? Mm. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below Of us are only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there is no country. Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to oh, Imagine all the people Living life in peace Ooh, You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world can be as one. Imagine no possession. Claire Bowditch, 
and Monique de Martina. Thank you ever so much. That was absolutely beautiful. At the Melbourne Town Hall on my final show, 23 minutes past 10. Red Simons has never understood that his breakfast radio session is not a one man gig. For an egotistical immature would be good. So that. much. Red Simons, Red Simons from Skyhooks, ladies and gentlemen. That, uh, that piece of music is one of the things I used to particularly enjoy about the ABC. That was actually a letter of complaint in the Green Guide, which I reconfigured as a little song that I would play every now and then. And... Um, it was sort of interesting when I first started the ABC because there was a lot of push Paul about, oh, done about him. No, he's good, done about him. But the last and final comment in the Green Guide, this is 15 or more years ago, and I would like to draw your attention to this, John. It said that presenters should only leave the ABC under two circumstances. If I die, or they die. (laughs) I'm not telling you what to do with your life. (laughs) And given that, you know, our relationship both on the radio and off the radio, there's an undercurrent of, uh, well, discomfort, let's be honest, hostility between us. (laughs) I think this is a special occasion for you, and I think it's time we had a safe word. And I'd like to suggest to you a safe word we could use in the conversation if either of us think it's sort of getting out of hand. And the safe word is Pell. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Whose idea was it to let him hear? We thought that we would just, you know, indulge you (laughs) and kind of give the audience a bit of a buzz and a thrill. And first of all, you upstage me by getting a standing ovation. (laughs) And then you tip us right over to the edge with a gag. Who ever expected anything else? Well, the good news is I've pretty much run out of material now. I've got bad news. You ran out of material years ago. Thank you very much. Oh, actually, neither of us will be here all week, will we? No, we will not. We will not. How are you? In regard... How are you? Uh, oh, don't ask me that Just question. answer. Do you want the long one or the short one? Not even the short one. Just a word or two. Not telling. Good. <laughs> uh, I do in the street every day, meet people who I feel warmth from in regard to the time we've spent together on the radio. Me doing what I do, you doing whatever it is you do at 5.30 in the morning. And there is something that everybody here may wish to participate in. It's entirely up to you. Um, If you would like the idea... Uh, If you can just write your address on a piece of paper, put it at the front door with a front door key, I'm perfectly happy to come round 5.30 in the morning. You don't have to turn the light on and and just talk at you. (laughs) I I should caution you. um, Well, I should invite you, John. Um, you may be, now you've got a little more free time. It could be that at uh, about 8.30 in the morning I leave and he turns up in your bedroom. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. 
So this is how not to deal with relevance deprivation syndrome, ladies and gentlemen. Are you coping? This is how I spend my every day. It doesn't matter <laughs> where I am. <laughs> Look, it's been, it's been awkward and difficult. And uh, since you left, the radio station has been continuously reminded of your departure. And that's difficult because the people who took over after you are my friends and Jacinta and Sammy have copped a whole lot because they're not Red Simons. So we kind of said, well, we're putting together a final show and uh, it wouldn't be complete without you. And yeah, management said under no circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them aren't management anymore. I don't really know. <laughs> But I loved the 7.30 cross and it became a bit of a ritual and the question that you and I, both of us, we've compared notes, the one that we were most often asked was, do you two guys really dislike each other that much? <laughs> <laughs> to which the honest answer is, yes, absolutely. <laughs> he's annoying, he's really annoying and that's what he said about me, but that's what I say about him. But I then, would argue, I would argue that if you are truly, if you truly know someone and you're comfortable with them, you can be critical of them openly, even on the radio. And I think you know who I'm talking about, John. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Red Simons. <laughs> and ironically, for the first time just about ever, it's half past ten and we're on time for the news headlines with Tim Callanan. That is the easiest round of applause anyone has ever earned on this stage. <laughs> there have been like generations of comedians, performers who've come up here. Not get, not get a reception like that. I've just, done, I've just sat down with some, put a bit of paper. How's that? It's too easy. But uh, I have been habitually late. It's been a running gag with us in the newsroom and with my producers going, the headlines, they're supposed to be on time. So here we are. To we be honest, be. I, don't, I don't mind at all because most of the time I'm sitting there like everyone here is, just glued to what you're saying. And, and it's been that way for, for years. But I think I've been doing the news reading gig for about five or six years now. And... To be honest, I don't even notice the time because I'm sitting there, I'm listening to what you're doing, I'm involved and I'm captured like everyone else has been. And, and John, look, I, I have to kind of speak on behalf of uh, the newsroom in Melbourne and all the journalists who've worked with you over the years and thank you for everything you've done and um, your efforts and your, your interviews which have been exceptional over the years and have provided so much content for all of us. And we just know that if there's someone of importance in a newsmaking event that's going to be on your program, then you'll get the answers out of them, and uh, we couldn't ask for anyone better to do uh, that interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, because now we're running late. Now we're late, sorry. Tim yeah. Callanan has the headlines. <laughs> to the headlines. Good morning, John. Renowned ABC broadcaster John Fain is hosting his <laughs> morning show on ABC Melbourne for the final time this morning. Mr Fain began his final program by speaking to a number of former, current and prospective Victorian premiers who all claimed to respect and even like him, <laughs> despite considerable evidence to the contrary. <laughs> Mr Fain made an explosive claim during the middle part of his program that he cynically used a state government job offer to further his own career with the ABC, <laughs> securing both a contract extension and a pay rise. And community groups have expressed their despair at Mr Fain's impending departure from the ABC. Several classic car enthusiasts have been seen openly crying in the street, <laughs> while midweek veterans hockey clubs are this morning flying their flags at half-mast. <laughs> Partly cloudy with possible afternoon showers today in Melbourne. A top of 19 degrees, a fame free week next week. More news at 11 o'clock.
Thank you, Tim. And uh, Tim will be appearing at the next Melbourne International Comedy Festival. <laughs> Sure, I'm going to bomb. No, this you'll is be fantastic. as good as it could possibly be. 27 minutes to 11, and now I'm running late because uh, my next guest was supposed to be on before the news headlines, but because I'm running late, we're going to have to squeeze a whole lot of things in between now and 11. And after 11 o'clock, there's music, there's all sorts of stuff coming your way, only some of which I know about. So, here we go. <laughs> Joining me on the stage, some of my absolute long-term regulars. Peter Gordon from the Western Bulldogs, David Whiting, our talkback lawyer, Debbie Enker from the Green Garden, Barry Cassidy from Insiders. Hey, Barry. Barry, what's it like? It's only been a few months, John, but when I turned up here, I said, can you steer me to the, uh, to the Fane event? And the guy at the door said, uh, are you part of the choir? <laughs> So let me just tell you, they forget very quickly, mate. <laughs> You're looking rather well, though, and uh, I, I suspect a little bit tanned. And those shoes, I don't think you can buy those locally. Where have you been? Bridge Road, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Bridge Road, Richmond. <laughs> bit of travel? But I have been doing a bit of travel, yeah. Planned yeah. a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, no, I can recommend it. Um, now that you're joining the ex-broadcasters club. Are, are you missing it? You're missing the, the Sunday mornings? No, no, I'm not missing the Sunday mornings at all. I'm sure that's one thing that you won't miss either as the, the early morning starts. Um, I'm missing the engagement, and I knew that would happen. Um, but um, we'll see what the, what the future holds. Well, there's much love for you here in the room, as, of course, you know there is, and from all the different things, including that fabulous evening that we did together, which is still on iView if you want to catch up with it. Yeah. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I can't think of anything I have to apologise to you about. I'm apologising to most people who come up on stage. Well, <laughs> over 18 years, she did often push me to move into the area of opinion, John, which we at the ABC like to call analysis. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I, I spent 18 years ducking and weaving you on that one. <laughs> yeah, right, OK. I thought we were just going to keep pretending at least until 12 noon. Uh, Debbie, I saw you just yesterday. Yes. And... Um, it was a bit different. Yeah, it was, and, and this is all a bit, like, overwhelming, actually, yes. quite frankly. Uh, you've decided that after millions of years of talking millions on ABC years. Radio, you've decided to pull the pin on that as well. And that must be hard, because you've... I know you've always put in so much work. You've put in such preparation for the segment. I've loved doing the segment. I've felt very fortunate to have the opportunity. But um, I, I think it might be time to end that chapter. Yeah. You're going to miss it? Oh, yeah. Radio, as a number of the guests here today have said, is a wonderful medium to be involved in. People really feel that they know you. I, I get much more feedback from my radio work than I do from what I consider to be my real job as a journalist. Um, people really feel that they know you when they hear your voice in their homes, and it's, it's a lovely feeling. Well, it's been enormously appreciated. You could hear the people going, no, <laughs> when we confirmed if they weren't listening yesterday, they found out today. And I know you'll be much missed, and I've valued and treasured absolutely all the hard work that you've put in. In contrast to Peter Gordon, ladies and gentlemen, who's never put in any preparation for our segment pretty much whatsoever. You just come in and, Peter, we just wing it. That's unfair, John. The first couple of years I did. It's did only been the last five. I mean, if I was debating someone about football who was actually, you know, in, in the zone... Who knew something about it. But uh, you, see, you tend to know a bit about your beloved Brisbane Lions, but... Um, Not a lot else. And apart from that, no, an ingrained hatred for Collingwood, which has never gone away. Oh, no, it's just... It's not really a hatred. It's just a kind of... It's fun teasing them because they're so feral. They're so easily aroused. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's part of the... It's part of the sport, part of the national sport. But, in fact, we do do some preparation. Usually about two minutes before you come into the studio, you send me a text or I send you a text saying question mark what and then you'll send me a text saying tipping question mark and then there might be something huge and you might put one word in and that's the full extent of our prep and in fairness you've also had me uh, impersonate all of the, your other guests up on stage I've done some TV reviews you've had me um, step in and give some legal opinions and one day when Barry was late and stuck in traffic you had me impersonate him um, <laughs> I think I was more right-wing than... Um... 
the audience have been used to with Barry, but uh, thanks for all those opportunities. It's been great. Uh, is it true that you've been offered radio spots with rival networks? Oh, look, a few years ago, but I think they confused our voices. I think it was... <laughs> Actually, you that they were probably looking for. I remember in the, in the first year, the nearest I came, I think, to getting sacked from your segment was when I tried to sing, and I had that old song from the 60s, Big Bad John. Um, you remember that? You, you said I could come back as long as I never did that again. Yeah. In fact, there were a couple of those from time to time. No, it's been absolutely fantastic, and it just so happened, of course, that during your tenure as a regular on my program, you won a bloody flag. We did indeed. We did indeed. Can I say in all seriousness that um, I, I, part of the reason for taking it seven years ago is, is that the Bulldogs in those days didn't get a lot of media. In yeah. fact, we were bagged as being the most irrelevant uh, club in the uh, competition. You, you gave us a bit of a chance for exposure and um, um, I think you're entitled to claim credit for that flag. <laughs> I've heard some bullshit in my time, but that <laughs> takes the cake. Mostly from me. Yeah. <laughs> and David Whiting, there are, if there's 1,800 people in the hall... There you go. It speaks for itself, so I don't know how many billable hours you've given up, and I don't know that we could calculate the value of the time, the dollar value of the time you've given to the ABC. But actually, I want to thank you, because what you've done also is reminded people that they have rights. And that's the fundamental un undercurrent to our chat every week. Well, look, I enjoy it, John. I tell people you started on the Monday and I started on the Tuesday. You know? But it, it's a huge commitment of time and you've been doing it even before you started with me. You were doing it with other presenters, because yes. there were other presenters before me, actually. And <laughs> it's an incredible contribution. There are not many, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I, Peter, you've been in the law as long as I have. I do not know another lawyer who can go from family law to employment law to a subdivision to drainage issues to a transport accident matter to no matter what, including we've had some weird and wacky things and you are unflappable and if you don't know you say I'll find out and then you know by next week and you just sail on. It is extraordinary. I must say, John, it keeps me on the ball. But can I remind you, John, that um, 20 years ago, you leaked an envelope in the studio. <laughs> and it was my big opportunity to move to the other side of the desk. We have to fill in the gap in between. What happened was that during your segment, uh, I had an allergic reaction. No, no, it wasn't during my was, segment. While you were waiting. You were talking to Mick, Nick Miller from the leader newspaper group. That's right. And every, just before 10 o'clock, they would do a review of the, yep. of the weekly papers for the regional, for the suburban papers yep. and uh, John multitasks and there's this million things he can do other than talk to the person on air. He was doing some mailing so he licked an envelope. He had an allergic reaction to the glue and he ran from the studio. Well my face started swelling up. Yep. And his producer sort of sat on one side of the desk and then we swapped so I got to sit in John's seat for about half an hour and my biggest sweat point was that I know from radio that the top of the clock is desperate. You've got to come out on the pips. So I'm talking to Nick, and then I'm thinking, we've changed call signs. We're no longer 3 0 We're now 774-ABC. And I, I think I fluffed that bit, <laughs> but I came out at the top of the clock. And my other story, John, very quickly, is um, when John took his six months off to go to Europe in a car, uh, I gave him an envelope stuffed with cash, right, as one does. And so there were, I had uh, Indonesian currency, Malay currency, Lao curry currency, Thai currency, Vietnamese currency. Not much of any of them. No, no. <laughs> it was, was only enough for a cup of coffee. And when John drives his vehicle across the causeway from Singapore to Malaysia, he pulls out Ringgit. And when you arrive in a country, you're supposed to create a thing called a car net, which is a guarantee that you will re-export the car. John, uh, having ring it, they push him on, so he doesn't get the uh, car entry documentation in Malaysia. And he gets to the Thai border, which is quite some distance away, and they didn't want to let him go. So who knows what we would be doing today, but for <laughs> that. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm running late. I'd love to talk to these people for longer, but I can't. Well, not now, but maybe tonight. Look forward to seeing you all. Barry, Peter, David, Debbie, I've treasured every minute of your contribution. And thank you very, very much. <laughs> 17 minutes to 11. Sammy J. Sammy J in the crowd. Where are you? Hello, John. Oh, there we Hello, are. John. Halfway I've been back. Swamped by audience members who want to talk to you. Someone wants to give you a Collingwood uh, a scarf. I, I said he could, wasn't allowed. Bill from Surrey Hills, was it? That's right, Bill. Someone else wants to read you a poem. You've got plenty of time ahead for that, so they can find you in your, in your spare time. Uh, Thierry here is, how old are you? Nine years old. Nine years old. So there you are, John. You're encouraging the youth to wag school. Who said you didn't? <laughs> who said you had no legacy? Uh, but, John, this is not planned at all, but I was approached by um, a woman who did want to say a very quick hello. Uh, we have referred previously to a certain uh, infamous wink that occurred on air. Please uh. welcome Gloria to the show. Oh, wow. Hi, John. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Uh oh. I've well, never rung and I've never spoken to no, you. Exactly. No, exactly. I offered you a free call yeah. for as long as you wanted and promised not to tell Jan, and yeah. you don't call and no. you don't ring. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Thank just you. glad. <laughs> I'm he, glad we could confirm that. He didn't deny that. or confirm or deny. <laughs> this is Gloria who called in and told Tony Abbott she couldn't live off the fixed income of a, of a government pension and instead she had to supplement her income working on a phone sex line which led to the infamous wink which led to headlines around the world about what a jerk Tony Abbott was. <laughs> and I don't think, Gloria, I don't think I've ever met you or anything else, but thank you. It certainly was an iconic moment. It's the perfect introduction to federal politics because joining me up on the stage are three federal politicians. Senator for Victoria from the Liberal Party, Scott Ryan, President of the Senate, Janet Rice from the Victorian Greens, and Mark Dreyfus from the Labor Party, the Shadow Attorney General. <laughs> Scott, the wink. The wink. How damaging to Tony Abbott was the wink? Wasn't helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a few other things that weren't going well at the time, so. Yeah. Like a knighthood for Prince Philip. I do remember that. I remember waking up to that and actually not believing it. And Tony's offering to come back if you need him. Oh, look, I think, emphasise the second part too. I mean, I think he, he, it was a formulaic statement. No need, to read, no need to read too much into it. No, no need to read anything into it. In fact, why not just say no? Well, I make a habit of not speaking on behalf of others. No, but on behalf of yourself. Do you want Tony Abbott to come back? I've always had the view that it's a matter for party members and electors. I don't try oh. and tell people what to do. Um, Why don't you just say no? Sometimes... Let's put it to the vote. Those who... I don't think... To be fair, I, I, I don't think this is the audience he'd be pitching to. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes discretion is better, particularly in my position. Um, what is, given that, I mean, the ABC and some of your Liberal colleagues have said to me over the years, oh, the bloody ABC, it's our enemy talking to our friends. Our Liberal Party people, they all listen to the ABC, even though they love to bag it. Is that right? Well, that is apocryphally attributed to John Howard. I, I don't know if it's actually true, but that is apocryphally attrib attributed to him. I, and I've, I've always had the John Howard view of politics, that every microphone is an opportunity to explain your position, to defend your position, or to prosecute your position. Um, yeah, you know, coming on your program, I think I described myself the other day as an occasional victim in my new role. I haven't had the, the same status to do that as often. but. It's been an opportunity and you've always been uh, able to have an argument, have a discussion and allowed us to contest the debate. When, and, and that's what radio is about. And if I might say, that is what your program has been part of Melbourne because Melbourne is a different media market. Um, the media market down here, for anyone practising federal politics, you know that from radio to newspapers to television, 
It's different to a city to our north. I think that reflects in some of the comments the Premier's and Opposition Leader Michael O'Brien made earlier today. You've been part of that and well, I think well it makes done. our got, city better. Well done. You've got a plug-in for Michael O'Brien. That just shows you Well, how... you described him as a Premier, I recall. I was yeah, listening. Briefly, so. I corrected myself. That shows you how nimble and agile Scott Ryan, President of the Senate, Victorian Liberal Senator, continues to be. Janet, thank you very much for joining us. And despite recent personal tragedies, it's especially good of you to have been prepared to come and speak here. Um, I've probably given the Greens more of a hard time than the major political parties Yeah, we've years. noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know that I've actually set out to do that. It's just it seems the Greens feel sometimes like, well, hang on, we're, but we're good. So you have to be nice to us. No, I think it's because we're pushing the envelope more than the other parties. And so I think probably it does make us, you know, more open to criticism because we, in, we want to see change. We're not just happy with the status quo. And so a lot of our ideas are challenging. And is the ABC your preferred outlet? Because you have fairly, dare we say, um, hostile relations with the Murdoch media by and large. Yes, because I mean, the Murdoch media tend to be more interested in sort of the, their own well-being rather than sort of the future, what's in the interests of the future of the wider country. And absolutely, you know, we know that sort of people who are more likely to vote Greens are going to be likely to be listening to the ABC. They are sort of people that are um, concerned about ideas. They're concerned about what, you know, trying to create a better society. Which is why we cop it in the neck if we dare. You know, it's like shooting Bambi. If you dare criticise the Greens, the ABC Greens-loving audience absolutely turn on us from time to time. Thank you for coming along today. Mark Dreyfus, ladies and gentlemen, of all the people I interview in federal politics, there are very few with whom I have a genuine, actual, personal friendship. And Mark and I go back to the 1980s, in fact, when we uh, had something to do with each other when Mark was a volunteer at Fitzroy Legal Service and I was the lawyer who was trying to supervise volunteers, which is hilarious, it was like herding cats. But um, <laughs> it's extraordinary to see, Mark, here we are, we're on the town hall together and uh, you're the Shadow Attorney General and previous Attorney General and I'm wandering off into the bushes. Well, you're not exactly wandering off, John. <laughs> uh, but it is amazing to be able to disclose that I've known you for more than 40 years. Uh, I've known you since you were a junior tax lawyer. Oh, There's dear. a bit of news for everybody here. And uh, you thought you'd get away with not, people not finding out about that, but you stopped being a tax lawyer and moved off to the community legal centre sector. And your commitment to justice and decency has been on display ever since. Uh, has Bill Shorten... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, has Bill Shorten rung you and said you've got a chance tomorrow to get revenge for what he did to me in the studio yesterday morning? Uh, he did not. No? Uh, and you've never given me an easy time, and it's you've true. never given Bill an easy time. I don't think you give anyone an easy time, but that's the beauty of what you've done. Well, it's... I'm asking for an easy time. Try. Yeah, OK, you've got one. I mean, it's what we're required to do, and it's the old Tony Abbott line, isn't it? He introduced me to Margie once when we were both at the Boxing Day test, and he introduced me as an equal opportunity mongrel. And he said, this is John Fain, he does mornings on the ABC in Melbourne, he gives everyone a hard time, he's an equal opportunity mongrel. And I thought, OK, yeah, that'll do, I'll quote him on that. It's probably the only time Tony Abbott and I have agreed. He likes cars too. Does he? Oh, that's right, he used to drive an old Rover, didn't he? Oh, I can't remember, but He yeah. did. You know, Tony and I grew up not far from each other. I grew up in Chatswood and he lived one oh. suburb away in Sydney until we moved down here. Anyway, that's another story for another day. But federal politics, I mean, the situation is as extraordinary as it is. One of the things I don't understand just at the moment is that the federal government, Scott, have decided that they um, kind of manage their media very differently. It, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get some of the key ministers in the government to come on air. You, or is that just me? I, I think there's a bit of you in that. You've said that to me on numerous occasions, even when I was a minister. <laughs> um, look... The media demands on, on, on ministers, and Mark will accept this, um, I think they're a lot greater than they used to be 20 years ago when I was a junior staffer in politics. Um, and that, that, that's not necessarily an excuse. I generally had a view of saying yes, and we had some you know, yep. challenging interviews on air, and that's your job. We, have, barnies, yeah. we have different jobs, and I respect that, that you have a different job to mine, and my job was to defend my position. Um, but look, I don't speak on behalf of, any, of others. No. Different ministers have different ways of dealing with the media and their portfolio. Please give Peter Dutton my regards. Ladies and gentlemen, could you... There's no other way I can pass them on. If, ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Scott Ryan, Mark Dreyfus and Senator Janet Rice, who have very generously agreed to come and spend far too brief a time here on the stage with me.
and thank you all very, very much. Seven minutes to 11 on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. John Fane with you at the Town Hall at the FFS. Fane's Farewell Show. Well, there's two concerts here. By the way, where's my coffee, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Is that hard, that hard to get a coffee in the ABC? Well, the um, cafe that is being built will open right. later this um, year. You can come back and enjoy it then. In fact, you opened this building. Yeah, I built it. Yes. I built this building. I built Altamo as well. <laughs> Paul Keating who was in the studio not that long ago. Uh, look, I'm running late for the open line. I think Marcus Padley from the Marcus Today newsletter has heard that a thousand times. Seven minutes to 11. Marcus, good morning to you. How are you? Mark it up or down? Uh, I think this morning it's up. Tweet, uh, Trump must have tweeted something or other about the Chinese. <laughs> Usual stuff all how, over the place. How terrifying is that? Uh, uh, I find it really quite remarkable that the stock market does follow him around so closely, even though we know his fickle, egocentric uh, agenda uh, really isn't, isn't uh, geared to the you know, benefit of the stock market or financial markets. What's the financial value to your business of popping up on the ABC every day? Uh, John, you know that because I've been delivering bags of cash to you for the last... <laughs> 11 years. I think you've re-sprayed a couple of your cars on the back of that. Uh, for the sake of the removal of doubt, I'll just record that I think I got a promotional pen no, you've from got one. And you've Marcus got another Padley. one? Another and one. <laughs> and another draft, one. Draft and corruption. <laughs> draft and double corruption. Who wants a Marcus Padley? And the, Marcus the, re today, pen. the rest of this bag is for you, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Virginia Trioli is rushing over for the pen. I might say they are very fancy pens because they've got a kind of little light torch LED thing in the uh, end yes, of them. Uh, I was going to hand them out. I was going to hand them out to the front row, and I did this once at a conference. And the idea was, that if you heard someone lying, you would shine your pen at them, <laughs> right? And then I got up and did my talk, and it was just a, a whole sea of. <laughs> Sea of pens. I know you're going to cut me off, John, but let me just tell you my one pre-prepared uh, little story. When I first started with you, your, one of your producers, and, and John would, would be nothing without the producers that we have to deal with, um, uh, I think, was it Dan Ziffer? He told me, Marcus, no one's interested in what's coming out of your mouth. They're not interested in numbers. They're not interested in the stock market. They're only interested in your chemistry with John. <laughs> they want to know whether you're sleeping with him. Flirt was the instruction. And I have to say, John, I have found some men attractive. <laughs> but you are certainly not one of them. And thank you, Marcus. And that anecdote tells us much more about Dan Ziffer than it does about anything else. No, it's been absolutely wonderful. And the fact that you've been able to make the Stock Exchange report come alive, make it interesting, and it's not just numbers and crap. That's absolutely wonderful. It's, it's one of been, your great strengths. It's been my pleasure, Thank John. you. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Marcus Padley, four minutes to 11. There's a whole lot coming up after 11 o'clock on what's masquerading as the conversation hour today. There's music, there's performers, and then there's gaps in the rundown, and I don't know what's supposed to go in there. Could you welcome to the stage, to her stage, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Cap, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, John. Good morning, Good Sally. morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I have to thank you because the town hall you run as a business unit and you rent it out for significant amounts of money, which meant the ABC couldn't have come to do my show in the town hall. And you were very generous in pretty much virtually waving that into We have feet. some discretion for charitable causes. <laughs> 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 so thank you very, very much. It's and lovely to see everybody here and to feel this room full of such positivity and warmth and really love for you, John. Uh, look, love for the ABC and I'm, I'm a vehicle for that love to the ABC. So You'll keep I'm, deflecting till the end, I'll keep you? deflecting yeah. past the end, actually, <laughs> way, way past. But I've also been in the situation where you, you took over a difficult, well, a shit sandwich, let's face it, when uh, you came in as the new Lord Mayor, and I have several times 
caused you some grief on air. Uh, and you've been terrific. You've said, well, that's your job. You do your job, I'll do my job, and we'll just keep going. Thank you. You are scary. Uh, but you have trained me as well in terms of understanding. He's so delightful when you're off air and then this button goes on that says on air and it's like white line fever. John absolutely steps over it and almost becomes a different person for some of those moments. And uh, I've sort of got used to that, kind of. Uh, but look, I do appreciate that you're trying to find out the truth on issues that are important to you. You're trying to put across really important ideas. And, uh, you know, I think we, we all value that. Thank you very much. It's way too brief because, of course, in typical fashion, I'm running late. But, I'm ladies happy. and gentlemen, thank you to Sally Cap. <laughs> thank you very much for coming along. Before we get to the 11 o'clock news, Claire Bowditch and Monique de Martina have got another song for us, apparently. So it's a love song for Papa Bear fame. Things will never be as they were But we knew that, we knew that We all knew that on the way Things will never be as they were But your love walks with me Your love walks with me Your love Walks with me, your love walks, yeah, your love walks with me, your love walks with me, your love walks with me. We love you, John Fane. I'm gonna bloody miss you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Monique. Claire Bodich and Monique to Martina, and lots more performers coming up. On ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria Digital Radio, the app, the stream and all the rest of it as well, it's coming up to the 11 o'clock news from the Melbourne Town Hall. Five past 11. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the final hour. At the Melbourne Town Hall, the final hour of my time on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Welcome to the Town Hall, those of you who are here, and we've got more in the last hour than you can possibly imagine, and if we get through it all, it will be an absolute miracle. There's a gap at the end, I don't know what's there, apparently I'm to be ambushed, so there you go. Could you please welcome my co-host and esteemed colleague, Casey Bonetto who is at the microphone and armed and dangerous. Casey, good morning to you. The hour chimes. The people take their places. A hush descends across the ABC. And in the crowd, some melancholy faces. But that don't really make much sense to me. Cause I'm in denial I've got a big, great, happy smile I don't understand the fuss today at all Y'all might emphasize it But I refuse to realize it It's an ordinary conversation Now we're at the Melbourne Town Hall Cause if I thought of closure I might lose my composure And if I did The tears would start to fall But there ain't no need for grieving Because no one here is leaving It's an everyday conversation Now we're at the Melbourne Town Hall Conway's also co-hosting There's Mick Thomas here as well And we'll also hear From Vicar and Linda Bull In fact, the schedule seems unusually full And there's no accounting for it I guess I best ignore it Cause I it's the height of current style When the truth is 
is at the speaker's beck and call Build that wall So I'm sure that he'll endeavor To do this job forever And it's a box stand conversation Now we're at the Melbourne Town Hall Town The wonderful Casey Bonetto. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been one of the thrills and highlights of having Casey coming into the conversation now that he will just magically make up something extraordinary like he has just done today. Sadly, though, we're already one minute late now, Casey. Oh, sorry. oh this thing is being machined to within a micrometer's measurement of precision here. Our first musical venture. Deborah Conway and Willie Ziggier have very generously agreed to come in to perform for us live to air on today's Town Hall performance. Deborah and Willie have performed for us in the studio many a time, and Deborah has co hosted multiple times. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the stage here at the Town Hall. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, really. I'm, I'm, can't even believe it. I, we got public transport today. I didn't even use my seniors' card. <laughs> I wanted to pay full price. <laughs> what have you got for us, my dear? What? What have you got for us? Well, we thought, you know, after a bit of head scratching, the best song that we could play you, feeling, feeling your, your interest in all of this, was, uh, was a plea to the ABC, and we're going to play for you today, Release Me. <laughs>
Deborah Conway and Willie Ziggy, how appropriate. Thank you ever so much. 14 minutes past 11, I need to check. Are there any T-shirts left, does anybody know? Because if there are any, yes, there's a few T-shirts left. At the back of the hall, you can still buy T-shirts. They're $30 cash only. And if there are any left afterwards, I have to buy them at cost. So please make sure there aren't any left over. And I don't know what sizes there are, but we only got a limited number and they're available for sale at the back of the hall. And the other thing, I do remind people, whether you're in the hall or you're listening to us wherever, uh, we are trying to raise money for the Career Heritage Trust on this My Last Show, and if you're here and you haven't made a contribution, you're a freeloader, and if you're listening at home, I'd encourage you to make a contribution because you are getting something by listening to it on the radio. There's a lot of stuff still to come, including, in a moment, Vicar and Linda Bull performing for us here up on stage as well. Casey, Deborah, one of the things I've never understood, you give your time over and over again, you come into the studio, you perform on what are really for musicians unfriendly hours. Why? You can say that again. So why, why do you do it? Well, well it's, it's because your office won't release the photos. <laughs> we, we have to do what we can to keep them under wraps and, uh, and therefore we're always called in. But is it, I mean, it, 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 you're incredibly generous. Is it a commercial proposition? Is it a, a commitment to the cultural life of Melbourne? What well, is it? It's become a bit of a habit, actually. I've become addicted to fighting with you, John. I've sort of enjoyed that over the years. It's actually, look, I, it's a very exceptional day for me because I'm coming in today and I've got literally nothing to promote. I'm not selling anything. It's, um, it's you know, kind of a wild and crazy concept. But um, when, I... When, when you are, am a, does it work? Yeah, I don't know. I, th I don't know. Do people buy tickets when you come on radio? It's sort of, it's just, it's fun to joust. It's, look, I have done some fantastic conversations out hours with you, John. We've talked to Elvis Costello. We've talked oh, yeah. to Chris Tealy, which who is one of my favourite musicians of all time. And I got to see his show that night and I was just blown away. Susie Quattro. Uh, the, the, the list goes on and on. There, there's been so many incredible conversation hours I've had with you. I wouldn't trade them for anything. Casey? Absolutely. For car parking, Ab for example. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. Absolutely. I, 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 I mean, uh, Deborah's, uh, let me echo Deborah's sentiment in saying that the, the folks that, that we get to talk to as a result of coming in are very much the payment in it. I mean, I've, I've got to sit with you and Stephen Sondheim for an hour and talk about musicals, you know, or Trey Parker and Matt Stone and... Stephen Schwartz from Wicked. Yeah. Who wrote Wicked. Folks whose, whose path I would not necessarily cross except while I'm, you know, strumming my guitar in the street and they toss a coin into the guitar case. <laughs> um, so the opportunity to actually, sure. you know, embarrass myself in front of them is... Uh, is oh, and Randy Newman, James Taylor, Katie Lang. You've had uh, them all. Uh, well, you know, they don't come in to talk to me. They come in to talk, ladies and gentlemen, they come in to talk to you. 
That's the fundamental equation, isn't they it? They always said they said that radio would, wouldn't last out with television on, on its way in. Yeah, video killed the radio star. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing would. But radio endures. In fact, radio endures more than television, it would appear. <laughs> oh. Is that, what they, is that what you do in Radio Land when I make some pithy comment? Is everybody standing around the kitchen <laughs> applauding? I just want to know. Who, who knows? I don't understand anything about it. In fact, the more I do it, the less I understand. Deborah Conway and Casey Bonetto with me here on the stage at the Melbourne Town Hall. Vicar and Linda Bull, together with Dion Herini, have very generously agreed to come in and do a song for us. Now, I have said this before and I'll say it again to you too. I often have you on repeat rotation. That Vicar and Linda live album is one of my absolute favourite CDs. Thank you so much for coming along today. What have you got for me? many years ago, maybe 25 years ago this year, on your show, and we thought we'd end with the song we started with for you. Uh, and we're going to miss you, John. And we just wonder, when will you fall for us? <laughs> Me. 
Wow. Vicar and Linda Ball and Dion Harini on the guitar. I reckon we could pretty much cancel everything else and just get them to sing a few more songs and people would go away very, very happy. That was beautiful. Thank you ever, ever so much. Thank you. And you two are extraordinary. And I can't believe I'm up here with the four of you. Sometimes when I get to muck around with people who are musicians of your calibre and you do things in the studio, I pinch myself. I absolutely think, how on earth did this happen? We often think the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we love watching your face when we sing for you, John. It was always an absolute joy to see the reaction that we got from you behind the desk when we sang. Yeah, yeah and people have made fun of my kind of chair dancing. <laughs> You do the best chair dance in the business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you say that to all the boys. <laughs> no, only you. <laughs> and I, I don't apologise for it because I don't know how someone could be in my situation and not react to the music. If you're actually listening, if you're paying attention, if you're giving yourself to it, well, it moves you. Yeah, that's true. That's just how it is. Yep. That's just how it is. And um, you've both been doing different things. You've been off doing the, Vicky, you've been doing the, the touring the whatever it was show, the oh, Ella Fitzgerald show. I did Edda James. Edda James, I've sorry. I've been doing that for seven years, John. Seven years? Yeah. Are you sick of it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do something else now. You're going to? I hope so, with Linda. Yeah? yeah? You guys have been doing this incredible show. You've been doing, you did it at the Adelaide Festival. Yes. yes. And uh, you're about to do it in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, uh, it's what, a, basically the story of our life told through song. And Julia Zamira commissioned it for the Adelaide Cabaret Festival. Yeah. And What's we, it called? It's Between called, Two Shores. And it's if you want Between tickets, <laughs> I tried to get on, online the other day and buy them at the Playhouse Theatre. Almost sold out. So we've added an extra delay. show, actually, Deborah. We've They've added, added an extra show. We've added show. a matinee on it's Saturday. It's going to whip out the door. Yeah, it's Saturday, yeah. Saturday afternoon show. It's basically songs that we want to sing, that we've wanted to sing and haven't sung, songs that people have written for us that have made our careers, and songs that we grew up with, um, growing up in Doncaster with our Tongan and Australian parents. It's really a story of our lives told through our music. Yeah, and a little bit of fun in between. Yeah. A lot of fun in between. Vicar and Linda Bull, Between Two Shores, from the 21st to the 20... Is it 4th now? 20, 22nd, so Thursday, Friday, 2 on Saturday. OK, and this at the Playhouse at the Arts Centre in Melbourne. Could you thank them again, ladies and thank gentlemen? Thank you. Thank you, John. And... Amongst the many pinch you moments that I've had, I might say pinch myself moments, those are absolutely right up there. I simply adore what you do and thank you ever so much. So Deborah Conway, my co-host, Casey Bonetto, my co-host, Vicar and Linda Bull, now my co-hosts. I don't know how many co-hosts can you have. And we're joined on stage now here at the Town Hall at 26 minutes past 11 by Mick Thomas, who has got Brooke Russell on guitar, Ben Franz on double bass, and Mick's come here to tell us about his new comic book that he's just put out. Morning to you, Mick. Morning to you, Joe. No, well, you're not here to talk about the comic book, are you? But congratulations. Thank you very much. And may that take off as well. What have you got for us? Sorry? What have you got for us? I've got a new song from our new album. It's our current single, a uh, brand new film clip animated by Angelo Madrid, who uh, did the comic book also. It's out today. So. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Just in time for Christmas. Do you want me to play it? Do you want him to play it, ladies and gentlemen? No, I, I don't think that was much of a reaction. Do you want him to play it? That's better. Yeah, they're artists. You've got to love them. Make them feel loved. Go right ahead. This is called Anything You Recognise. Frozen in my mind on a blistering summer's day you came walking down a deserted high street 1996 a year A summer's evening I walked out of the video shop And you waved with mock embarrassment As if polishing a low window as you walked on by I hadn't seen you all weekend But you didn't walk on by You stayed I stayed And we stayed Eighteen empty shops, 
That was the record number I counted in that strip and that's 18 businesses gone bust because no one could see their way clear to shop anywhere but the plaza in those days. I rang a friend to go for a drink on a Thursday evening and nothing was open. But we had stuff to discuss. See, we were breaking up the bands with nowhere to walk on by to. We stood on the deathly street and figured it was somehow fitting. There was talk of renovation, rejuvenation, a reimagining, but we weren't buying it. Eight in empty shops, no one buying anything. Where you live now, do you see? Signs painted over into memory. A concrete sky on a cracked footpath. Would you say hello as I walk past? a block of flats at the end of the street and we could not believe how high they were or who they would find to live there. One day we came along and we found a tape around the building site like a crime scene on a Scandinavian television drama. Seems a crane had tipped, crushed some poor bloke as he stood. They even drew an outline of his body on the road. Again, like a crime scene on a Scandinavian television drama. Hell, it was a crime scene. They waited a few weeks and they went back to work, building the new high street skyline. We walked on by, we talked of moving. Where you live now, do you see? Signs painted over into memory. A concrete sky on a cracked footpath. Would you say hello as I walk past? That day outside the video shop, the business has gone bust and the outline of a dead man on the road. Do you see the days, the miles and the thought that we might leave as but a fleeting proposition? What do you see as we walk on by the new high street skyline, 24 hour gymnasiums, balcony dogs, Friday night food delivery motor scooters and a dazzling array of yoga schools? Look at me, do you see anything you recognize? Because I stayed, and you stayed, and we stayed. Where you live now, do you see? Sights painted over into memory. A concrete sky on a cracked footpath. Would you say hello as I walk past the quarry that became a tip? The tip that then became a park An old Greek woman out there walking With the ghost of her husband in the dark Anyone you recognize Do you recognize anyone at all? Do you see anything you recognize? Do you recognize Anything at all Do you recognize Anything at all Mick Thomas Brooke Russell on guitar, Ben Friends on double bass, and Mick, your roving commissions at the Healesville Music Festival, and then pre-Christmas shows I've got here at the Spotted Mallard and the Caravan Club, which should keep you pretty busy between now and eternity. I am pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> Lots on. And well-deserved. So coming into the ABC over and over and over again over the years, uh, it, it's an extraordinary thing. It, I hope it helps with the extraordinary musical career and journey that you've managed to build. It has been incredibly uh, helpful, John, and I can't say enough uh, thanks to yourself and um, 
bunch of other people forgetting. It's in there with the demise of music on uh, Radio National. It's been very important to the palette of uh, Melbourne uh, original music that you keep getting people in. So I really do think it's been a great thing. And you've never fallen into that trap of saying, I'm just uh, current affairs. I don't know much about original music. You've always sort of done the, done the work. And I really do appreciate the fact that you, you always know what we're playing. When I don't half the time. So, you know, good on you. <laughs> But one of the things that worries me is that with fewer and fewer places uh, for you to tell the public about where you actually are performing, sure. the responsibility of local radio is greater than ever. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Deborah. Ab absolutely, it is. Um, it is imperative that uh, that we find, you know, some kind of uh, way to broadcast our message. But it's all narrow casting these days. It's all you have to, you know, you have to do something outrageous on social media, and then everyone will take notice of you. So you know, you all have to take your clothes off, or say you really <laughs> like Donald Trump, or something, and then everyone will tweet you out, and uh, and then you'll get some people to your show, just throw tomatoes or something. I don't, but, um, I don't know that I don't know that Mick taking his clothes off would actually would help. Draw I'm not sure that <laughs> taking my clothes would help. I take my clothes off. With it. But, but no, 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 you, it's a real, it is a real thing. It's like, where do you go? What do, who do you tell? Because the, the newspapers are kind of shrinking too. We're living in a very changing world. But, um, you know, you've got to adapt. But there are... There are, there are trams. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, there are trams. There are, there are so few um, outlets that have the sort of imprimatur that, that, that your show does with, uh, with the sort of current affairs focus that give any spotlight time at all to the arts. I think Mick's absolutely right. They, they, they just aren't... The, those focus points don't exist. And so um, to have... Particularly on the conversation now where you do find yourself sort of... I've come in to co-host it and you find yourself... You know, I find myself like metres away from Mick as he does something amazing on guitar or for Deb and Willie or from the Bull Sisters or from any number of the musical performers. And uh, it, it's... The, the privilege is... It, I know it's not only for us in the studio, but for folks listening out there to hear these, you know, tremendous musicians and playwrights talk about plays and all that sort of stuff. And, okay, and I, I think, I think the, 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 one of the te tests of that is that Melbourne does have a really strong music scene, and I think the 774 has been a really big part of it. And the test of it for me is, I don't know if the other girls find this, but as you travel around the country... Some of the other local ABCs are a lot more difficult to navigate and get on. You know, I mean, I know that I might get on in Perth, Adelaide, maybe Sydney, never, <laughs> Brisbane, hardly ever. You know, Tassie, maybe. You know, but but uh, seven seven four has always been very receptive, and I think that goes for touring musicians as well. I know well. I, you're yeah. right, actually. I, I um, yeah, Perth was really difficult this la the last time around. It's been really t tough. Perth, Perth has, t has turned. A couple of years ago, Perth was a place you could always get on the local ABC, but yeah. not now. You know. Yeah. Um, well, we take that very seriously because we get the benefit of it. I want to thank you all, Vicar and Linda. Thank you, John. Deborah you, John. and Willie. We're going to hear more from Casey, apparently. Maybe so. Mick Thomas. Could you thank them, ladies and gentlemen? They've been thank absolutely you. wonderful. Twenty-four minutes to twelve on this Friday. I haven't left this to the end because I don't know if I'd get through if I did. <laughs> but a few words from the rostered morning announcer. Thirty years at the ABC, maybe a hundred thousand interviews, hundreds of thousands of talkback calls, shows in fires, floods snow and even at sea. Cameron, looking at you, Helen, <laughs> Prani. Celebrities, politicians, business leaders, cops and crims, sports heroes, clowns, actors, musicians, authors, singers, charlatans, fakes and frauds. But always you, the audience. It's an incredible privilege to be trusted to help you tell your story. We should not use our lives to make ourselves look good or to show off. The ABC can leave that to the worst of the shock jocks and the tabloid monsters, those narcissists who use the media to tell people how to live their lives and what to think. And unlike them, it's the ABC's style guide to trust the audience, to give you the contest of ideas and to hold power to account. 
And if that means enraging powerful people, then so be it. If it's ever a choice between being liked and being respected, be respected. Because it's those same hypocrites who scream that the ABC is out of touch or entirely from their self-interest. They say the ABC is a waste of public money. Stripped bare, they just want us to get out of their way. They think that anyone listening to or watching the ABC is just costing them money. They want to steal you, the audience. Hilarious. As if. Every day I've learned from you, the community of listeners, and I want to thank you, every single one of you. Those of you here in the hall, thank you, hooray to you. First time callers, doubly welcome. <laughs> and those who are listening to the wireless, to the app, the streaming service overseas, here in the city or in the country, on the whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> In the kitchen or on the tractor, you, the audience, you are why we exist. If we ever forget that, we're lost, because live radio is the best bullshit detector ever invented. There's nothing like the intimacy that radio provides, and there never will be, and we must use those powers for good, not evil. In my 30 years on air, I've wept, I've laughed, I've tried to help. I've bitten this tongue so often and so hard, sometimes I was surprised it didn't bleed on air. To all the people I've angered, offended, and sometimes even hurt, I'm sorry. I've always tried to both inform and entertain, but never at anyone's expense. It's not been all joy and laughter, and today would not be complete if I didn't say something about Jill Maher and the Black Saturday fires. Horrible events that I had to broadcast and they've undoubtedly left scars. We made a promise to the bushfire communities that we would not just descend upon them, grab their stories, use it as media fodder, and then move on. Instead, we said we'll be here for the long haul, the recovery, the tussles with bureaucrats, insurers, and government, and I hope we've kept our word. And on that night, that emergency broadcast, it didn't save everyone, but we did our best. When Jill was so cruelly murdered after office drinks on a Friday night, how ordinary is that? The emotional turmoil for those, especially those much closer to Jill than I was, was immense. And that morning when her body was found and a man was arrested, we knew the details straight away. What his prize were, the whole story. And yet we had to respect the process and not say anything that may have helped him to wriggle out of responsibility. It was ghastly. To Tom, Jill's parents, her family, her friends, I send you another big hug. And the killing of women just going about their business has not stopped. And we must somehow, we must make our community safer. And now the thank you part. To all of those who have created today, taken on a huge amount of extra work and stress, time away from far more important things, I thank you. Katrina, especially. <laughs> but also Matilda, John, Dina, Felicity, Barb, Sally, Kat, the entire team, all those ABC staff who have volunteered in their own time and are here today acting as ushers and whatever else. I thank you. A very special extra thank you, though, for the audio team led by Tim Simons in a suit, ladies and gentlemen. In a suit. I think they did that to make me look shabby, and it's not hard. And while I'm apologising for things, my longevity in this shift has crueled several people's ambition. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> the ABC would not produce anything if not for the unpaid overtime, the dedication, the skills and commitment of all the people who work there. We do love to whinge and gripe, but underneath all that, we do know how amazing an organisation it is. I can't name every single producer who's helped me try to sound sensible, 
But it started with Tom Balombi, who asked me to freelance on the law report on Radio National after I left Fitzroy Legal Service in 1987. Polly Rickard taught me to record and cut edit with a razor blade, cutting block, chinograph pencil back in 1989. Anita Barrow, the late much missed Jilly Hocking, Kathy Ford, and then to 3LO and my first producers, Dave Lane and Louise Cooper in 1993. And then to the investigators in 95, Kathy Baker and the team, and Wise Up, 95 and 96, Evo Burham and the team there. But now in this incarnation, you've met Prani and Glenn in 97 through to until now. The recently funny, generous Dan Ziffer, thank you, Dan, and now the incomparable Katrina Palmer, Matilda Marozzi, young journalist of the year, richly deserved, and for many years now, the calm and unflappable presence of John Standish, wherever you are, over there hiding, typically, looking after the convo hour. Every day, I've put my life in your hands. Long-term producers, I can't thank you enough, and I can't exhaustively list every single person. So to anyone I've left off, I'm very sorry. Lorraine Deal, Ainsley Hodgkinson, Neil Davey, Andrea Carson, Nicole Chavastek, Mary Bolling, Andy Burns, Sarah Ashley, Deb Levitt, Claudette Worden, Joe Jarvis, Jane Dullard, Cameron Burgess, Helen Taylor, Natalie Jones, Tim Lammercraft, Erin Matthews, Beck Ritters, Amber Tripp, Courtney Carthy, MJ, Mary Jane Fennick, Ashlyn McGee, Hazza, Harriet Lundborn, Liz Gray, Cameron Burgess, Pete Dillon, Chris Yulman, Michael Pavlich, Sam Stainer, Nadia Hume, you're all part of my extended family. The collegiality is precious and I hope it sustains. And as well as producers, a roll call of panel operators, but especially Florenz Ron, who's just retired. But then there's the office crew, master control, marketing gurus, building staff, payroll, maintenance, IT, and especially the complaints department. <laughs> I've kept them busy. And multiple station managers, some of whom are probably wishing they'd seen the back of me while they were in charge. Dina especially, though, you've been amazing. And I want to thank those managers who sacked me back in 94, Steve Ahern and Barry Chapman. Son, whatever your future is, it's not in radio. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And now the really hard bit. I am a radio presenter, but much more than that, I'm a husband, a father, a son, a brother, an uncle, a friend, a grandfather, to various degrees of imperfection and neglect. And I know that what I've chosen to do for a job has caused my family, and especially Jan, Jack and Nigel, all sorts of complications in their lives. I'm sorry. On the other hand, years ago, Nigel got to join me on a helicopter ride. And a young starstruck Jack met Steve Waugh and got him to sign his cricket bat. So it's not been all bad. And it's especially wonderful to me today that my father, Solly, at 93, has been brought in by one of my sisters, Susan, and been able to join us here in the town hall. And, Dad, that's extra special. <laughs> and if you're listening at home to my mother, Eva, who's not able to join us, but very much is with me, and now, to my secret weapon, the most important person in my world. Jan, will you? Jan and Jack coming up on stage. Jan's always avoided the spotlight. My wonderful, funny, beautiful, and always sensible Jan, the soul of our family, my best friend, 
my sounding board, my grief counsellor. I know there have been far too many interruptions, too many ruined outings and what was supposed to be quiet evenings, too many distractions, even last night. <laughs> too much unwelcome attention. There's nothing I can ever say that explains adequately what you've done for me and what having you at my side has meant. And I know how much you're going to enjoy this, but in front of the packed town hall and all the people listening, <laughs> as simple and as complicated as it is, I love you. I love you more than anyone. And I'm hoping now we can wake up and go to the movies, <laughs> take the dog to the beach, slow walks on the coast or in the country. And most of all, I hope I don't get in your way. <laughs> <laughs> and when we get home, we'll put the kettle on and we'll sit down and say, what the hell was that about? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Do you want to say anything? Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> For me. Um, it's certainly been a ride, and I guess lots of people here may, well, some people may have seen earlier footage of John on telly doing investigators, wise up. And I realised that John wanted to stay in the business but he needed a job where he could work 24 hours a day, seven days <laughs> a week. Because the poor guy had a problem with his energy level. <laughs> <laughs> it was obvious from there. So this has been it. The best job he could do. I knew we shouldn't have let her near a microphone. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jack, wonderful to have you here on stage. To Nigel, who now lives in Arnhem Land, to all our friends who have come here, it's been a hell of a ride. It's been an absolute blast. But hey, 10 to 12, let's party! What's happening, Casey? All it says to me is, leave 10 minutes at the end. Uh, for people who haven't bought a T-shirt, I don't know if there are any left. And if you haven't, there are a few left at the back of the hall. And if you haven't made a donation to the Koori Heritage Trust, please, I ask you to do so. That would mean a lot, a lot to me. I would really appreciate it. Casey Bonetto. Hello, is this the ABC? I'm trying to reach a show. John Fame. John Fame. Long time listener, first time caller. Doubly welcome, yeah, I know. John Fame. John Fame. I need to get a message through. A simple serenade To do my best to tell the host The difference he has made A sentiment he may not entertain John Fane John Fane Since 1997 Born upon the morning air John Fane John Fane While others did the hard work He was talking in his chair John Fane John Fane He tried to leave the law behind It wasn't far away 
tried to prosecute the day And oh, so many felons to arraign But in his way he brought about a better, wiser state And we may never see his like again Thank you.
Thank you. What have you got next? <laughs> All we've got is a vamp on that groove. <laughs> <laughs> Casey Bonetto, ladies and gentlemen, and... May I explain, the people who have come up on stage, because the audience who are listening who are not here at the Town Hall do not realise, apart from Wilbur on saxophone, Wilbur Wilde, but there are, um, there's 50 or 60 people who have invaded the stage and sung the chorus. There are colleagues who go back to my very earliest times. Peter Mayer's there, who was with me at Radio National, 1989 when I joined Bevo, Connor, Derek Gill, Lane Canty, countless co-hosts, people from the current lineup, uh, colleagues like Ben Knight, producers, presenters, researchers, musicians, newsreaders, George Megalogenis. I mean, I can just, I could sit here and name you all and we'd run out of time, we'd crash into the news and I'd get into trouble. I can't thank you enough. I'm absolutely overwhelmed to everybody who's listening, to everybody who's here in the town hall. It is absolutely extraordinary. I. I pinch myself. Jan, thank you. I can't believe you agreed to come up on stage. <laughs> and not only can I believe you came up on stage, you spoke. And I um, shouldn't tell you this, but I just lost a huge amount of money on a wager that you wouldn't do it. <laughs> and it was worth losing, absolutely it was. Uh, Jack, thank you ever so much. And to Nigel and Rachel and Rosie who are up at Ramanginning and I hope listening to us. We wish you were here too. We really, really do. On ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria, digital radio and the what, what, what? That's it for me. It's news time, 12 noon.